गुड मॉर्निंग एनी क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम मिस्टर एस क्लास एनी क्वेश्चन क्वेरीज नो क्वेश्चन नथिंग ओके गुड so did you start to make uh, process of making the maps yes okay good if yes then good then uh, what else is there okay today's class i think uh, mughal painting tradition is done so we have to start from uh, the bahmani tradition is one and uh, then after that i have to go to ragmala paintings and post ragmala paintings will come to modern paintings and after that we'll move to since fourth uh, drama and uh, dance also i think i'll be able to finish today Okay, only music will be left out, and music will be done tomorrow. And along with music, I think in modern India also there is one class which is left out. Okay, so alternative voices of nation. Me, I finished till the Muslim alienation and politics communalism discussion I have done, but I did not talk about Justice Party, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Okay, nothing is done. Workers, peasants, women movements. No. Okay, so that I uh, will pick up tomorrow along with music. Okay, so you bring the handout. I think the handout is given already. So if you have the handout, please bring it. Okay, alternative voices of nation. Car. So tomorrow we will be able to finish modern India too. And uh, the day after, I think in ancient and medieval India, uh, with respect to political line, I think I am left with this Vijayanagara Shivaji. Post Akbar period is left out. So post Akbar period I will do. Okay, so the day after, so that will pretty much uh, uh, wind up history. Is there anything else left out? That's it, right? Okay, only internal security is left. Okay, internal security. Me, I'll see. Okay. Uh, In a week's time, okay. Internal security. I'll restart the classes. What was the last topic discussed in internal security? Border management, I think, if I am not wrong. Uh, North East India is left out. Border management, did I discuss? Okay, I talked about this piracy issue. Okay, piracy is also done. Now I am. Uh, I will be left with uh, North East India is one, and uh, I think in internal security challenges, we discussed about radicalization, terrorism, India-Pakistan issue. Everything is done. Okay, uh, India-Pakistan boundary issue, India-China boundary issue is also done. Yes. Okay, so I think uh, then uh, what will be left is uh, Northeast insurgency, cyber security is one topic, and uh, social media and uh, uh, its uh, protection. Okay, that is one more topic that is left. And border guarding forces is not very important for the examination. Till now, they didn't even ask a single question. If you want, I can give a good material for you. Okay, so that need not be discussed. Maybe two sessions for internal security. Uh, internal security will also be done. Okay, let's see what uh, else uh, we have to do. Hmm? Now, let's uh, start our discussion on uh, painting tradition. And uh, yesterday's class, Mughal painting tradition. I think you people understood what is what. Yes, who started what tradition and uh, what kind of themes they have selected, where they painted, what is the technique that they used. Okay, slowly you have to understand that from the Mughal period itself, the European influence it started showing itself. Okay, from the time of Akbar, initially Humayun period only, the influence of Persia. Then from the Akbar's time, what happened is there developed an intermixture between Western style, Indian style, and Persian style. And this intermixture it got its full maturity during the period of Jahangir. And Jahangir's paintings are considered as classical paintings of Mughal period. Okay, so he is very important artist uh, of his own merit and. Uh, He also patronized a lot of artists. That is the reason why he is very important for us. UPSC also asked two years back only they asked a question on Jahangir, okay, painting tradition of Jahangir. So slowly, okay, uh, the Persian line decoration, okay, ornamentation, all of these things got influenced with the Indian emphasis on roundness. Okay, slowly some Indian colors also started being uh, rep uh, replicated there because in Persian paintings mainly there is a domination of the colors blue and gold. Okay, from this uh, domination slowly uh, the Mughals started. picking up some colors which are very indian okay like red saffron so these kind of colors also started being picked up so then uh, along with that in terms of technique also because of the influence of the western europeans they started okay showing perspective okay then along with that realism in paintings so these kind of things they started emerging okay so this is a, a important period okay mughal paintings pe there is a possibility of an independent means question on mughal painting tradition alone okay because when they can ask a question on persian literature during medieval period Okay, this can this is quite possible. Okay, this is quite quite possible. Uh, very good school too. Then after that we have the Bahmani school of uh, uh, painting. Just uh, listen to me first. Then after that I'll uh, show. Okay, it's not uh, a very tough one. Okay, when it comes to the Bahmani school of painting, in Bahmani school of painting, the Bahmanis in their construction also they were influenced by the Persians first. Then apart from Persians, the Bahmani rulers later day they were also influenced by the Mughal painting tradition on one more direction. And apart from Mughal painting tradition. they were influenced by the okay they had trade contacts with china because of which they were influenced by the chinese painting tradition too 
and along with the Chinese painting tradition, they were influenced by the European painting tradition too. So four different schools and along with that, the Rajput painting tradition also influenced them. It means that Bahmani school is an admixture of five different schools. Okay, five different schools, all of them, they put together, led to the emergence of Bahmani school. And in Bahmani school, okay, some important aspects are, most of the things are similar. Initially, the paintings are, are two-dimensional. Slowly, because of European influence, they started showing images in three-dimensionality. Okay, then along with that, the color palette and other things, they were mainly influenced from the Mughals. Okay, colors, the Mughal color tradition is mainly followed. And their paintings are also miniature paintings. And in some of the paintings, we can clearly see the Chinese influence in terms of attire, facial features and structure also are completely Chinese. Then, along with that, okay, what they did is they also used the same old technique which is used in Ajanta hierarchical scaling, you remember? Based on the significance of the person, the image's size is determined. So this hierarchical scaling was also used by the Bahmanids. And along with that, okay, they had given a lot of emphasis on ornamentation. Okay, ornamentation they gave a lot of emphasis on exaggerated poses also they started showing figures in, just like the Vijayanagara Empire period. Okay, exaggerated poses, then uh, ornamentation. Then along with that, one more unique aspect of this school is that whenever a, wherever a image is placed, what they used to do is uh, behind the image they used to construct an arch. Okay, so arch construction behind the image is one more uh, unique thing about this tradition. And the themes that they selected were mainly Indian themes. Okay, and Indian themes, themes too, some of the Bahmani paintings, they also picked from the Ragamala tradition of India. So there are a separate school of paintings which are known as Bahmani Ragamala. So this Bahmani Ragamala is a little important for us, but later we'll discuss about it. Okay, what is Ragamala? Once I talk about it, then you'll understand what Ragamala is. Is this clear? So this is the Bahmani school. That's it. Okay, nothing much. Okay, you just need to know that Bahmanis had a painting school of their own, which is an admixture of five different schools. And there is hierarchical scaling, which is used. First, two-dimensionality, slowly three-dimensionality. Okay, arch shapes. And mainly, the compositions had a greater emphasis on women. And there is a very famous painting of uh, <coughs> the Bahmanids, which is known as Lady with the Mina. You can see it. Okay, the Chinese woman. She is having a Mina in one hand. Then one more painting of theirs is this uh, painting, which is known as Lady with Hukka. Okay, see the, see the handout. Both of the paintings are there. Hmm? Yes. Okay, just have a look at the slides once. The Deccan school, it is eclectic. Eclectic means admixture of various schools is known as eclecticism. Okay, if a person, he adopts from various things, then it is known as eclectic. Persian, Mughal, Chinese, European and Rajput influence. Okay, lady with the mina is this. Can you see the attire of the lady? Okay, it is uh, completely Chinese. Okay, and along with that, even uh, the decoration is also Chinese here. Okay, and the background painting of the palace is also Chinese. Okay, so this entire painting is a Chinese influenced painting. Even the color palette is also taken from China. Okay, this is one thing. And this is the lady with the hookah. The lady with the hookah is a, this one more painting. This is also a very prominent one. Okay, these two are the important painting traditions of Bahmanids. And they use this system which is known as hierarchical scaling. Okay, then uh, richness of the color composition, usage of white and gold. Then intersection of diagonals, diagonals to form an arch around the central figure. And there are some Ragamala paintings too. And there is usage of jewelry and usage of exaggerated poses, you write. Exaggerated poses are present here too. Exaggerated poses. But here too, you can't see any full frontal face is not there. Okay, three-fourths or half face, quarter. Okay, half face or three-quarter face. Now, okay, the next theme is known as Ragamala theme. First, listen to what these Ragamalas are. Okay, Rajput painting tradition, the most important miniature paintings are known as Ragamala paintings. So there is a high possibility of a main question on uh, this Ragamala painting. So because the Ragamala paintings, they form or they are, are the admixture of various traditions which are present in India. Okay, Ragamala, even though it is a painting, the main themes that Ragamala painters drew are based out of the Bhakti literature. Okay, Bhakti literature, there is a lot of literature. Okay, Gita Govinda of Jayadeva, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, then many others, they have written a lot of uh, poems about Lord Krishna, okay, and other gods of their own. So what these Ragamala painters did is they picked up the themes from that and they started depicting them in their images. So the first theme is it is an outcome of Bhakti movement of medieval India, first. And the second thing is during this period, okay, the musical traditions of India were also developing, okay, both Hindustani and Carnatic, but most of the Ragamala paintings, they are surrounding around Hindustani music. 
and when the music was developing okay what the musicians did was in order to remember the ragas properly okay in order to able to recite them properly what they did is they started attributing each raga to a single god okay like one raga it is attributed to a god one more raga is attributed to a different god this way ragas were up attributed to different gods so that is when okay what these painters started doing is okay they started uh, giving it to it uh, different god one and the second thing is they also started personifying the ragas into human form listen to me first okay just like the natural forces personification is done for the sake of religion similarly ragas are also personified as human beings and each raga is given a particular shape it means that a particular image is given to each raga and the raga is also just not the raga but okay what they did is the raga ragini is the wife of raga and they had raga putra and raga putrika so this way okay they created a complete family around the raga first they give a god to raga then they created a family around the raga and what these artists did is they started okay drawing these ragas on paper okay so rather than just about recitation and writing of the ragas what they did is they wanted to replicate it in an image format and while replicating it in, in an image format what they did is they selected okay the ragas arch type they drew the ragas okay then the god who is associated on one corner they started putting then along with that each raga is supposed to be sung during a particular season means that each raga it should be sung only during a particular season or if the raga is sung okay the person who listens to the raga he feels that particular season no okay you might have heard about some great singers of india who when they sing they were able to move the monsoons also even rain used to come it means that even it is a different season through the invocation of the raga they were able to bring out that setting okay all of this are don't laugh but uh, they are very serious matters at one point of time okay so there is a big tradition on uh, around this so each raga is associated with a particular season and each raga is also supposed to be sung at a particular time of the day it means that some ragas are specifically allocated to mornings some for afternoon and some for evening are you getting okay and some for night time. so what they did is in these paintings okay in order to depict one raga what they used to do is they first used to set the season in painting okay then the time of the day also they used to set then after that okay the raga and ragini raga putra and raga putrika they used to depict on paper then along with that the associated god also they have to they used to depict in paper then along with these things one more important thing is each raga is associated with a particular color okay while listening to a raga okay so i don't know whether it is possible for all human beings but some musicians they say that each raga it can invoke a particular color in your mind so while drawing these paintings the same color which is associated with the raga is highlighted when compared to other paint other colors it's too complicated right okay five things of raga's translation into painting one is god associated with raga then raga is personified into a human being along with his family third thing is the season is determined time of the day is determined and fourth one is what the color of the painting is also determined predetermined so these are known as a ragamala paintings on one side there is the influence of bhakti tradition on the other side there is the influence of raga sorry the musical tradition of india of hindustani classical music all of these things combinedly together they formed the ragamala paintings okay are you understanding raga mala ragamala means what music which is denoted in the form of a painting is known as ragamala painting simple okay so it is at the interface of bhakti is one second thing is this a musical tradition okay and the third thing is there is a painting tradition which is associated with it that you understand okay and when depicting okay the ragamala paintings mainly okay in mughal paintings if you remember there is dominance of secular subject matters when compared to religious matters it is only about the court scenes okay life of common people these kind of things are drawn but during the time of under the rajput influence what happened is in ragamala paintings rather than material life people it gave more significance to the spirituality spirituality and religion they formed the main theme for these paintings and earlier mughal paintings if you see mughal paintings had some or some element of realism to them okay they tried to replicate people as they are but these people okay they rejected realism they started creating okay images on the basis of their imagination okay imagination and mainly the themes which are selected are krishna along with krishna in vrindavan is the main subject matter of ragamala paintings Okay, Krishna in Vrindavan along with Gopis along with Radha. So this is the main theme or subject matter of most of the Ragamala paintings. And here the predominant emotion which is shown in the painting is also this Viraha. Okay, when the Gopis are longing for Krishna, 
Radha is longing for Krishna. So this kind of viraha is the dominant emotion in the Ragamala paintings. Are you understanding? Because in Bhakti also, viraha is a very important emotion. If you remember, I told about it once before. Okay, wherein the Bhaktas, they started identifying themselves with gopis and Radha and they were longing for the sake of grace of Lord Krishna. Forgot. One. Okay, so that is there. The same theme, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I very clearly told about it. Okay, he was the one who started, okay, using this allegory wherein the Bhakta became Radha and the God became Krishna. And when the individual is longing for God, okay, that same emotion is translated into painting in Ragamala paintings. And the predominant emotion of the paintings is Viraha. Okay, then along with that, I told you that the main uh, theme is imaginative. And along with that, okay, in these paintings, rather than the palace settings, the rural settings, they dominated. Because Krishna in Vrindavan is living in uh, rural areas. He is shown as cow herder. Okay, then after that, he is shown, okay, playing some pranks against the gopis. Then uh, Radha Krishna love story. All of these things are mainly depicted in these paintings. And they are, okay, uh, having this element of idealism. Okay, and dream-like character. Okay, they are not real. Okay, they are not very close to reality. They have this dream-like character. Okay, how dreams happen in your mind? Okay, they are not very clear, right? So that same way, okay, here also there is a lot of lack of clarity. Then along with that, if you see, most of the themes which are drawn, okay, bhakti-based themes, everything is done. Okay, when you look at the color palette, okay, color palette also, there is a clear rejection of both blue and gold. Okay, blue and gold were present in very less amount. Okay, when compared to the Iranian paintings, here the blue and gold color, are present in lesser detail then along with that okay most of the faces are shown in profile format here also there is no full face only profile faces are shown and uh, along with profile faces okay the people are dressed also in indian pattern and indian style okay indian ideas of dressing also are reflected in uh, these paintings okay and mostly the women who are depicted in these uh, paintings are shown very beautifully okay with a sense of sensuousness they have uh, drawn the women so, which is very, very important, okay, and there is a ornamentation too, but not too much ornamentation, but decent enough ornamentation is done in these paintings. These are known as Ragamala paintings. Are you getting this? So, it is a painting tradition which reflects Ragas on one side and Bhakti movement on the other. Satisfied? Okay, understood what these Ragamala paintings are? They are a mixture of painting, okay, painting and Bhakti and music. Okay, three traditions, they combine together. Okay, they formed these Ragamala paintings. Okay, so many paintings are there which shows, okay, Krishna playing holy with the, uh, the gopis in Vrindavan. So these kind of paintings were very, very popular. Okay, and uh, women were shown in a, a lot of, uh, with a lot of beautiful features. And the typical Indian idea of beauty, okay, there is slender figures with long legs and stuff. Okay, that is also uh, common here. Okay, Ajanta says that same tradition is continuing. Yes, okay, so this is uh, the story of the Rajput Ragamala. Initially, they were also drawn in a, on a, this birch bark and a palm leaf, but slowly with time, they also adopted to the paper-based paintings. Okay, is this clear? Just have a look at the handout. Okay, the main themes are love, romance, and bhakti. Love, romance, and bhakti. Okay, it contains the stories of Naikas and Naikas too. Okay, I forgot to tell about it. Naikas and Naikas are okay. In the medieval times, there were many books which were written now. Okay, and in these books, the books revolve around the love story of, okay, a hero and a heroine. Okay, so these themes are also picked up in uh, Ragamala paintings. And of these, okay, this uh, story is very, very prominent one, Chaura Panchashika. Okay, Chaura Panchashika is a love story between a Naika and Naika. Okay, Chaura Panchashika, very prominent one. Then along with that, okay, there are books like Laur Chand, Rasika Priya, okay, Bara Masa, which talks about the uh, 12 seasons of India. Okay, 12 seasons of India, Bara Masa, Chaura Panchika, Rasika Priya and Lord Chat. Okay, you read about the story of Chaura Panchika and Lord Chat. Both these stories you have to read. Okay, theme, theme of Lord uh, Chat and Chaura Panchika, you need to know. Okay, there is a good possibility of a prelims question on that. Okay, theme pay. Then, okay, Bhagavad Purana and Gita Govinda. Gita Govinda is written by Jaydev. Okay, Sanskrit, Jaydev. Okay, then uh, Ragamala themes were picked up. Paintings were done in flat and the limited usage of gold and blue colors is seen. Okay, most of the paintings are in rectangular format and side of the face is depicted, not full face. Okay, single large eye is depicted. There is no flying eye concept here. Okay, single eye. Okay, only half face rather than showing this way. Okay, single face usage of brilliant colors. It is a blending of a painting, poetry and music. Okay, painting, poetry means bhakti poetry. Okay, painting, poetry and music. More than just a sound, a raga, raga evokes an emotional response in the listener. It should color the mind. 
dreamy and imaginative in character. I told about this. Yes. Then themes of rural life, common men and palaces, all of them are given. And high spirituality is represented in this painting. And there is minuteness of treatment and proportionate figures. Okay, proportionate means size is good. Okay, and minuteness of figures because they are all miniature paintings. Miniature paintings. See this. Okay, I have given uh, the classification of six ragas. Okay, it is not possible that they will ask a question here. But just be familiar with them. So these are the ragas, Bhairava, Hindol, Deepak, Meg, Shri and Malkunas raga. And each raga is associated with one time in the day. That is morning, dawn, night, afternoon, evening, midnight. Then season is, okay, each has an associated season. And mood is, it evokes a particular mood. Each raga is evoking a particular mood. And this mood is also depicted uh, in the paintings. Okay, usually uh, Bhairava raga is considered to be, okay, having this peace as uh, its important theme. Okay, peace as its important theme. Okay, then Malkunas, it is associated with youthful love. Okay, it means that the themes or the stories also revolve around the same theme. Okay, when the characters are shown to, okay, display the same emotion. Yes, okay, you can depict courage, right? Okay, in painting, where Krishna, let's suppose if he is fighting, then it is supposed to be this Raga, that is known as Megraga. Okay, let's suppose if Krishna is uh, playing with the gopis, then it is known as Malkunas. This way, okay, very complicated uh, vocabulary, right? Okay, but just uh, remember this way. Then the next one is Ragmala paintings are based on ragas and life of Krishna. Fusion of music, painting and poetry, it's already done. Okay, and uh, Ragmala paintings were present not only in Rajput paintings, but they are present in Rajput paintings, Pahari paintings, Dakkan Ragmalas were also there and Mughal Ragmalas were also there. Okay, Ragmalas were drawn in all the traditions. All the traditions. Okay, medieval Hindustani musicians they associated each raga with a deity, naming the raga perhaps as a means of memorizing the melodic structure. Okay, intrigued poets of the late middle period then personified the ragas and elaborated their tales in vivid verbal imagery. Okay, vivid verbal imagery. Verbal Im imagery means okay, personification of ragas. It is given. Okay, personified the ragas. Then these stories, along with other influential texts on Indian classical music, provided the poetic source of ragmala painting like Rasaka Priya and Laurchit. Images of dancing poses and personified musical notes were used to enliven the text. Okay, so these are the things. But I think you understood the essence, right? Okay, the crux of the thing you understood, right? Now, in these paintings, each raga is personified by a color, mood, a verse, describing a story of a hero and heroine. It also illustrates the season and the time of the day. Okay, this paragraph is very important because all the things are there here only. Okay, color, mood, uh, season, time of day, okay, verse. Right, in which a particular raga is to be sung and finally most paintings also demarcate the specific Hindu deities attached with the raga like Bhairava with Shiva, Sri with Devi. Okay. But they are not only ragas but their wives, raginis, their numerous sons, ragaputras and daughters, ragaputris, everything is depicted here. Then devotion and love, especially unfulfilled and consuming passion that is known as viraha. In Indian tradition. Okay, unfulfilled and consuming passion is an overarching theme of Ragamala paintings. While love in union is occasionally represented, scenes of longing and loss frequently hold center stitch. Getting it? Okay, so meeting is not important, but the waiting is more important for these people. Okay, so that is the case. Next is uh, Ragamala paintings backgrounds also contain typical Indian themes with green trees, Blossoming flowers sometimes depicting the rural life and sometimes reflecting the palace life of princess. The inclusion of fuller spaces is meant to emphasize the lack of boundaries and inseparability of the characters and landscape. Okay, everything is well integrated and well proportioned figures are there. In this way, the individuality of the physical characters is almost rejected, allowing both the depicted backgrounds and human figures to be equally expressive. So this is a little important. I forgot to tell about this. See, earlier in Mughal tradition, if you see the images of the emperor, they dominate the background. If you remember, okay, so an earth is an earth shaped figure is present uh, beneath the legs of Jahangir. Okay, is the earth given any significance there? No, okay, it means that the background is little important when compared to the personalities. But in Ragamala paintings, both the personalities and the background, both of them have equal significance. It means that one doesn't dominate the other. Okay, so you write this down line down in Ragamala paintings, the backgrounds and Ragamala paintings, the backgrounds and
and backgrounds and the people backgrounds and the persons persons carry equal weightage carry equal weightage okay so if i show some figures then uh, you'll understand it okay even better okay and in ragamala painting there are so many schools okay there are so many schools in ragamala painting okay on one side you have rajasthani schools and pahari schools okay and i think uh, somewhere around some 25 30 20 schools are there more than 20 schools are there but all of them are not important for us we'll just look at the broader themes in rajasthani ragamala okay that is uh, mewar marwar hadoti and dundar and once they asked a question on kishangarh school too okay but uh, not very very important just i'll tell about those paintings and when it comes to pahari paintings in pahari paintings also we'll do only three okay that is kangra and basholi and i think guler also will do okay these three things will do rest of the things are not very important for us is this clear okay each school had its own uniqueness but let's suppose okay tomorrow in examination if this ask a question on the marwar school of painting or mewar school of painting what you should do is immediately you should write all the points of ragamala painting that is the crux of all the paintings there is nothing different or distinct in each painting school only one or two points specific to each school okay only one or two points specific to each school just like the cave architecture you remember so it is all same but the the, the manifestation is different in different places dravidian architecture manifestation different but crux is same it means that if you remember the ragamala painting tradition then automatically you will be able to write most of the answers in mains okay but in preliminary okay the questions they are given about the specificity what kind of questions can be framed okay i have formulated uh, some ideas about some schools okay only from there there is a possibility of a question are you getting me okay so that is the case now we'll move to the ragamala painting tradition okay, the first one is the marwar school okay and we are starting with a painting on which upsc also asked a question this is known as the mona lisa of india that is bani tani painting okay this is known as the mona lisa of india it is uh, uh, present in uh, this uh, <coughs> Kishangar painting of Marwar school. Okay, Marwar school may Kishangar painting tradition is there. Okay, remember Marwar and Mewar. Okay, they were in continuous conflict with the Mughals. Yes, okay. So of this uh, in the Marwar school, okay, this Banitani painting is very very prominent. Okay, and in Marwar school mainly, okay, the main emphasis is here on okay creation of a or creation or what do you call it okay their main emphasis is on uh, beautification of women okay women form and women uh, beauty they wanted to standardize and for with this intention only they have drawn this painting called banitani painting and this banitani painting is a very popular one okay and it is known as indian mona lisa too because indian idea of beauty it is reflected here okay mainly okay what they did is they drew a face which had a very sharp and long face sharp and long face okay then along with that okay prominent uh, nose then drooping eyelids okay and very sharp eyelids then along with that arched eyebrows this kind of ideas are very close to indian idea of beauty and the woman is also slender okay well proportioned figure and her attire is also typical rajasthani attire with a dupatta okay and uh, the uniqueness about this painting tradition is with respect to this uh, uh, what is it called transparent odini which is uh, drawn on painting okay, it is difficult to draw a transparent odini right so but they have done this okay with beauty with a uh, great beauty and one more is curl lock over here it is the standardized form here okay curl lock over here here hair hair lock okay pointed nose pointed chin drooping eyelids arched eyebrows then along with that this curl lock over here all of these things are emphasized in the banitani painting and this is what marwar school centrally is about is this all right okay so banitani painting and features are mainly gita govinda and bhakti themes they have selected hunting scenes and court scenes Okay, not uh, very important. Most beautiful depiction of women faces have soft contours, not heavy contours. Yes or no? You can sense it. Okay, soft contours but not heavy contours. Then long faces with high and sloping foreheads, pointed nose and well cut lips and long chins. Beautifully drawn eyes and lock of hair hanging on the side of the ear is the central features of this Marwar school or Kishangarh school. Okay, so Kishangarh or Marwar. These are the features. Okay, so Maharaja Savant Singh is a major pattern. They are all essentially Hindu paintings, usage of primary colors. Okay, and this Banitani is drawn by 
the person by the name of Nihal Chand. Okay, Nihal Chand is the person. Review this Banitani painting. Okay, Savan Singh and Nihal Chand. Krishna Radha themes. Okay, some court scenes also there, here and there. Okay, but mainly, okay, these are Lagamala traditions and depiction of women is emphasized in these paintings. Okay, so this, can you sense, okay, the Ragamara painting uh, or Bhakti tradition which is being shown here. Okay, it is Krishna along with the gopis in a Vrindavan. That is the theme here. And background and the images have equal significance. See, okay, the peacocks and uh, the uh, greenery which is present and the central figures, both of them are given equal significance. But they also did not have any sense of depth. Yes, there is showed in particular for format perspective is not built. And most of the faces are profile faces here too. Okay, so this school is known as Mewar school and same thing sir, okay, it is influenced by only a few points you remember, Upper Brahmasa school, you remember Western Indian school, Jaina school of painting, that same school it influenced it. <sighs> okay, bright and brilliant, brilliant colors are used, long noses, oval faces and fish like eyes, females are smaller than male. Okay. And rest of the things are same, okay, ornate trees, bunch of flowers along with mountains and hills, decorated clothing pattern and use of headgear, images of court life also depicted. Same things. Okay, you need not remember each and everything about every painting. Okay, here just remember that there is a school called Mewar school which is influenced by the Upper Brahmasa style. Upper Brahmasa style, the rest of the things are almost the same. Okay, almost the same. Okay, only a few things, okay, but not important, sir. You can't replicate them. It is impossible. Just remember that they are influenced by Upper Brahmasa school. That's it. Okay. So this is one painting. Then uh, next school is the school called Hadoti school. Okay. Hadoti school. And uh, this school, it is uh, mainly present in uh, the Aravali hill region of Rajasthan. Okay. And the theme of uh, this school is scenes of pleasure. Scenes of pleasure, they dominate over others. Okay. And here, the blue and uh, gold color which have not been used earlier they started dominating Hadoti paintings it means that naturally they are under Mughal influence are you getting it okay they are under Mughal influence that's the reason why gold and blue color themes they start dominating okay they start dominating in this Hadoti school okay and the rest of the things are exactly the same and scenes of pleasure they dominate over this stories or themes of Bhakti okay Bhakti say Jada okay we find here scenes of pleasure this is the palace life Okay, palace life of uh, a person, okay. So, same, Indian uh, proportionate body, okay, you can see this. Proportionate body and other things. So, this is Hadoti school. And here, in Hadoti school, apart from the miniature paintings, okay, there is a mural which is present in this Chitrashala of uh, Umid Mahal. Okay, so it is present in a place called Bundi. There is a mural tradition here. Okay, you can see it, right. The entire walls are very thickly decorated. With mural paintings. Okay, so there is a mural tradition with the Hadoti school. The walls, ceilings of this palace are completely covered with paintings of the Bundi school, which are still in very good condition. Okay, Hadoti okay, under there is a Bundi school, but you remember just Hadoti. Hadoti. Okay. These are the kind of decorations which were used on walls. The next one is this Dundar school. Dundar school. Okay, and it gives more emphasis to folk art paintings folk art paintings and this school is important rather than for its miniatures it is also important for the wall paintings which are known as murals and the main murals are present in this palace which is known as Shakavat palace Shakavat palace in Jaipur okay, Jaipur is a very important uh, city right okay the pink city of India there there is a, this Shakavat palace and the palace contains these kind of images so that's the reason why it is more prominent and here also see profile faces everything is ex exactly the same even the long, uh, this, uh, uh, okay, uh -huh. long hair is also there. Okay, that, uh, what is it called? Curled hair uh, decoration. That is also there. Okay, profile faces, proportion, balance, everything is exactly the same. Just remember that, okay, this Dundar school is used to decorate in Jaipur city. Okay, Jaipur city may, the wall paintings are done with this Dundar painting. Dundar painting tradition. In Pari schools, may, there are three schools. Okay, Basholi, Kangra, and Guler. Okay, this is the Basholi school of painting. Okay, Basholi school of painting. Okay, Basholi school of painting. 
and uh, it is present in Jammu and Kashmir. That is the reason why it is important. In Jammu and Kashmir, okay, and uh, same themes. Okay, Rasamanjari, Gita Govinda, and Devi series by Devida. Same. And here, main important thing is emotions are a core feature of this. Okay, emotion is the core feature. Okay, that's like Bhava. Bhava, you remember? Okay, which is the best expression of Bhava in India? Which painting tradition? Imperial Cholan tradition, you remember? Okay, Imperial Cholan tradition is the best expression of Bhava. Similarly, here also Bhava is given more emphasis. And in this uh, uh, Basholi school, one unique aspect is that in order to decorate the paintings, what these people used to do is, okay, so they are not as rich as the Mughals, so as to use emeralds and others, right? So precious stones using is difficult for them. So what they started doing is rather than precious stones, they started, okay, uh, putting rice drops of white paint and on this white paint, what they used to do is they used to, okay, pluck the wings of beetles, okay, and stick them onto the paintings, okay, as a reflection of emeralds and other precious gems. Are you getting it? Okay, they catch beetles, they pluck their wings, put some white paint there, okay, and stick it onto the painting. So that is one unique thing about this paint. That is the only thing. Okay, they will be by thick rice drops of white paint with particles of green beetles wings used to represent emeralds. And that is one thing. Later day, this kind of uh, work is done in Gesso work in South India too. Okay, I will talk about it later. Okay, the stylized facial features show in profile is dominated by large intense eye. These colors are always brilliant with ochre color, brown and green grounds predominating. Not very important. Just remember, Basholi is Jammu and Kashmir, emotions and this. Okay, emerald decoration. And the next one is Guler. Okay, from here on, you can very clearly see that, okay, the depth is being shown very clearly. Okay, it is also under Mughal influence. And here, the Guler school of painting it is mainly known for its grace and delicacy. Grace, delicacy and spirituality. See, the, they also show a very good composition. And the color pa pattern is also very good in these paintings. The color palette is also very good. Naturalistic and lyrical style. Well modeled faces with slightly upturned noses. Colors of dawn and rainbow are well depicted. Okay, it means that the color palette is very good in this painting. Okay, but very less possibility of a question. Just think, remember that, okay, here the delicacy and uh, grace are more important in this school, which is known as Guler school. And the last one is this Kangra school. Okay, Kangra school. And this is important because this school, okay, it had two important things. One is it was able to show different shades of green. The palette, color palette is so good that they were able to differentiate between different different shades of green. It means that all the leaves in a tree, they will not be of the same color. Okay, some will be dried. Okay, other things will be there. And each tree also has its own uh, hue of green. So what they did is they were able to replicate these different shades of green in their paintings. And these are known as, okay, the paintings of based on uh, Vardant greenery. Okay, Vardant greenery means different shades of green were represented here. Okay, Vardant greenery is one important thing. And here all are natural colors and even poison was also used in paintings. Okay, the intention I don't know, but natural poison is also used in the paintings. Okay, natural poison is included in the paintings. Okay, what is the scene that is being depicted here? Okay, Kalia. Okay, Kalia and Krishna, that is the image which is being depicted here. Okay, and see many Naginis, they came praying in order to save their husband from Krishna's hand. Okay, so that is uh, the story which is being depicted here. Okay, and the main focus here is the Shringara Rasa. Shringara Rasa, okay, and uh, other things are not important for us. Just uh, remember this. Okay, colors from nature, no artificial paints, but and greenery. Sansar Chand uh, period, me. Okay, they saw their peak. So this is the story of Kangra school of painting. Okay, Kangra school of painting. So this itself is sufficient for us. Okay, we did not know even a single point beyond this. Okay, in the, the themes that I have given included also, you just remember the points that I have asked you to remember. Okay, rest of the things are not important for us. Is this alright? Okay, and already they have asked a question on Banitani. So they might repeat the question too. Okay, there is a good possibility. Are you people checking the previous year questions regularly? Okay, so I asked you guys to buy one book. What is the book's name? Visha Publications. Did you do you have it? Okay, are you checking the questions regularly? Are you able to solve the questions? See, that is the only way in which you have, you can prepare for the examination. No other way. Okay, the previous year question sets the boundaries for your preparation. Otherwise, okay, it will be 
institute centric preparation whatever a institute includes as part of current affairs you have to read it because you don't have any individual judgment of your own individual judgment will come only when you know the previous year questions otherwise it is not possible more judgment sir we don't have time <laughs> you want to think how many are uh, writing this year okay good enough good enough good enough most of the people are writing okay take the exam okay if you prepare for the exam only then only there will be seriousness if you postpone the examination what will happen is again we will postpone the preparation also to the next year it's not just about the exam even preparation will also get postponed don't do that okay so you please keep preparing okay don't waste your time and now uh, usage of multiple shades of green in the images elaboration of the female form with beautiful faces all of these things are part of this kangra school next in south india there are two schools of painting one is mysore and the second is tanjore school of painting okay when it comes to this mysore school of painting i think you know mysore paintings yes okay very prominent right okay very prominent and uh, some of them are very costly too okay some of them are very costly too so this mysore painting tradition okay what it did is its main themes are hindu gods and mythological characters are the main themes here and the paintings are done with a technique which is known as gesso work okay gesso work is the painting technique which is used in order to do this uh, make these paintings and what they do is here in this painting tradition they use okay uh, first and foremost they will first draw the image on either a wooden plank glass okay or cloth so three mediums are used wooden plank glass or uh, cloth is used and after that on top of it what they do is the first make the painting and after that they will put some lead on top of the painting and wherever the lead is placed on that they will impress okay costly jewels then uh, precious stones are stuck to the painting with the help of the lead paint which is drawn there are you getting this so this is what is known as gesso work just see this paste of white lead powder and glue used over which gold foils are embossed so it means precious stones real gold okay it's not uh, fake gold okay but real gold which is made into fine thin sheets they are attached to the painting that is the reason why these paintings are very costly okay and along with that emeralds and other stones are also embossed onto it and the themes are mainly hindu goddesses gods mythological characters they are depicted here that is the only thing about uh, this painting tradition just see this work is in low relief and intricate typically used for intricate design of cloths jewelry and architecture okay here the main emphasis is on the cloths and jewelry okay cloth and wood paintings fine line and delicacy of design emphasis on coral scroll yes so this is also important okay so the coral scroll is being shown here the arch type okay even bamani painting also it is present same thing okay coral scroll is the arch type which is present surrounding the painting that is given greater emphasis okay stylized and moral characters of mythology are depicted okay they are not realistic all the ways it is stylized characters from mythology they are picked up and they are drawn and the decoration is more important than the central theme here I mean, rather than the face facial expressions these kind of things are secondary okay but the ornamentation and decoration they become more important and the work which is done on these paintings is known as gesso work with white lead paint mixed with glue and on that okay the gold sheets are embossed is this all right so this is a school of painting which is known as mysore school of painting i think it has a ga tag of its own now okay ga tag of its own geographical indication tag is there next one is the tanjore school i'll fall okay so on the tanjore school it is a present from the time of nayakas okay nayakas of tanjore particularly it developed very well during the time of a maratha ruler over tanjore okay there were marathas post shivaji they came down south Okay, and some Maratha rulers they were ruling different parts of South India, and in Tanjore also there were some Maratha rulers. Okay, so don't get confused here. And during and under, under the patronage of the Marathas itself, this school it started developing in, in sport, proper format. And the person's name is this uh, Sarfozi Maharaj. Okay, Sarfozi Maharaj is the person who is responsible for the development of this painting. And these paintings are also done on glass and board instead of cloth as in North India. It is an offshoot of Vijayanagara style. Okay, and it is also done on wooden plates, so it is known as palgai padam. Okay, palgai padam is the term which is used to describe the Tanjore paintings. Okay, palgai padam is given there. Okay, palgai padam, and they used same things, sir, colors, ornamentation. And here the gesso work is again done here, but rather than using lead paint, what they do is they use lime. Okay, 
So they use lime powder and tamarind seeds. So it is different, a little different. Okay. And your paintings, limestone and tamarind is used. So this is a Tanjur painting. Typical Tanjur painting is this. Okay, colors, ornamentation are given more importance. Okay, gold, then uh, jeweled embroidery. Okay, then arch surrounding the painting. Okay, same things. Okay, same. Uh, see, actually, uh, most of our ideas of how God looks like they are formed based on this. Some of these paintings only. Yes or no? Otherwise. It is an artist who creates God for us. Yes or no? Okay, that is the reason why sometimes what happens is because we are influenced so much by the movies, suddenly if someone calls Krishna, okay, or uh, says Krishna, then I think people from Karnataka, they will get the image of whose image? Is there any movie actor who depicted Krishna very well? Krishna Duryodhana. Hmm. I think Dr. Rajkumar has done uh, Krishna character, right? No. Is done, but you don't get that image. But okay, no. Okay, fine. Okay, but it is usually the case in uh, Andhra and Tamil Nadu. Okay, a few characters they are almost taken to the stature of God. Okay, because they depicted the same God. Okay, so that's the case. Now this is the case. Okay, with the, the Gesso work. Just remember, Gesso work made there is difference. Rest of the things are exactly the same between Tanjore and Mysore paintings. So for the Maharaj. Okay, don't get confused with the Marathi name and Tamil place. Okay, both of them are present at the same time. Now, we'll move to the next section. There is modern paintings. And in modern paintings, first we'll discuss the painting traditions during colonial period. And after that, we'll discuss about the painting tra traditions which emerged post-independence in India. When the Europeans came to India, the Europeans brought their own ideas about painting traditions. Okay, their own ideas about painting traditions and their painting traditions because of the influence of Renaissance. Okay, Renaissance may we had painters like Leonardo da Vinci, okay, who drew Mona Lisa, Raphael, okay, Michelangelo. All of these are famous painters of a Renaissance period. And they developed some techniques of painting, okay, which are based on the same things. Okay, oil painting tradition is one. Second is realism. Okay, and the third one is perspective in paintings, foreshortening, lighting and shading. Okay, then overlapping images. All of these things were developed by the European painters. And these European painters, when they came to India in 18th century, there emerged first and foremost some British colonial painters were there. Sorry. Okay, some British colonial painters are there. It means that the governors who came to India. Okay, the governors and the British administrators who came to India, what they did is while coming to India, they brought some of their own okay, set of painters because they wanted to show their families and friends what kind of life they are having in India. They also wanted to, okay, because at the time there is no photographic tradition, okay, when the Britishers first came to India. So that is the reason why they brought some painters along with them and they started commissioning some paintings. And these paintings, they mainly contained three themes. Okay, and the technique is same, oil painting, perspective, realism, okay, then along with that, this uh, techniques of lighting and shading, all of these things are present. But the themes are important here. Okay, what they did is they brought some painters and these painters, they came to India. When they came to India, they were asked to mainly draw three kinds of paintings. One is known as picturesque painting, second is known as portrait painting, and the third is known as historical event-based paintings. Okay, and in first painting tradition, that is a picturesque painting, what they tried to do is they tried to Okay, draw the landscape of India. The okay, landscape of India, Indian villages, Indian towns, Indian forests, how they look like. Okay, these kind of paintings are known as picturesque paintings. And in these picturesque paintings, okay, the painters, what they did is they started, okay, selecting a particular landscape. Okay, and they started drawing. It. And in most of these landscapes, they had one idea. Okay, so they had one idea which dominated here. Okay, that is one is India is a country which has a very, very rough, rugged and tough terrain and living in India is not easy. One idea that they wanted to communicate because then only you will be considered as a hero, right? If you are going to this kind of land, okay, if it is very simple and good land, then you will not be considered a hero. So one is in picturesque paintings, mainly they emphasized on the rugged and difficult terrain of India. One. Second thing is, okay, second thing is they mainly drew the Indian urban and rural areas as if, okay, India is a country which is glorious at one point of time, but now it is in decline. And it is a call to the Britishers 
saying that, okay, you people have to come here and revive this glory. You remember Orientalism? Okay, that was the main influence behind the paintings. So one is rugged and difficult terrain. First, second is whenever urban areas are drawn, they are shown in terms of a society in decline. Are you getting it? And in some other paintings, what they did is they started showing, okay, the Indian cities which are in decline on one side and the European colonies which are progressing on the other dimension. Okay, European colonies which are established in India, which are progressing, that is also drawn in some paintings. Okay, this is known as the picturesque painting tradition. And most of these paintings, they are commissioned as very large compositions. Okay, and some of them are also known as oleographs. Oleograph means what? Okay, the painting is done and it can be replicated in multiple formats. It means that the painting is mainly done on wooden planks. Okay, wooden planks with carvings with them. So what they can do is the oleographs, they can be replicated in large number. And these images, they started becoming very popular in European world about the idea of India. How India looked like. Are you getting this? Because photographs were not there. So they tried to translate the message through this picturesque message. One. Second is a kind which is known as portrait kind of images. And in this portrait kind of images, what they tried to do is they tried to project the Europeans to be far superior to Indians. Far superior to Indians. In most of the paintings, the Europeans are shown with, with very good dress, okay, fair skinned. Okay, very, very dominating and uh, okay, strong personalities the Europeans are shown in. Whereas the Indians are shown somewhere hidden in the background. Okay, with their dark skins. Okay, very, very humble stature. Okay, as if the Indians are okay, born to be subordinate to the Europeans. They started showing the, some images in this format. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So this is known as the second kind of paintings which are known as portrait paintings. And the third kind of paintings are known as historical event paintings. And in the historical event paintings, mo mostly the paintings surrounded around... British victory or against Indian princely states, particularly the events of Plassey, okay, the defeat of uh, Mysore by uh, Arthur Wellesley, these kind of paintings, they started dominating, whereas when compared to the paintings, okay, uh, sorry, they, they started dominating the painting tradition, okay, so these are the three kinds of paintings, and when it comes to the colonial school, in this school, the main important painter are two brothers who are known as the Daniel brothers, they came to India, they stayed in India for more than 15 years and they continuously sent a lot of paintings back to Europe. The Daniel brothers are the most prominent painters in this school. Okay, 18th century, European artists along with traders, new styles and new conventions based on oil painting, realism, colonial superiority and perspective. Right? Perspective, three traditions, picturesque, portrait and history paintings. Okay. There is refinement of drawing, usage of perspective, ambitious architecture is shown. Okay. Picturesque paintings, they showed India as unexplored and rugged lands. Yes. Okay. And these rugged lands have to be converted or this is a call for the civilizing mission. Okay. And sometimes the British colonial cities are also drawn okay, to contrast them with okay, the Indian, uh, Indian uh, constructions. Okay. Just see this. Okay. This is one painting of River Ganga by uh, Daniel, Daniel Brothers. Okay, Daniel Brothers, they drew this uh, painting, okay, uh, the river Ganga, okay, see some of the uh, walls and other things that are shown cracking, okay, and here, this is the image which shows, okay, which shows uh, a colonial city, colonial city, so this side, whatever buildings are there, they are the earlier Mughal buildings, whereas here, these are European buildings, can you see the Greece style, okay, almost it is visible, classical Greece style, okay, then see the images of Indians, Indians are shown in this format, whereas the Europeans are shown, okay, relaxing, whereas Indians are working here. Yes or no? Okay, this is deliberately done, okay, and Indians are shown in very poor light. And here in these paintings, even more it is visible. See, okay, so they try to uh, replicate, uh, or this is the portrait uh, image, rich and powerful life-size images, and they are mainly commissions. See here. Okay, this is the painting. See, Indians, they are mainly shown as in the format of servants. Okay, whereas the Europeans, they are having some tea party. Okay, tea party. And this is also meant to communicate to the Europeans that in India also, they are having very good life. Okay, so that is the reason why they drew this portrait kind of paintings too. This is the last one, that is a history paintings. In order to dramatize and recreate British imperial history. A favorable image of British they wanted to show. And this is the event of Plassey. See, Robert Clive is being received by Mirzafar. Okay, Mirzafar is re receiving Robert Clive. This is one painting. 
Okay, this is one page, one more painting which shows the fall of Sri Rangapatnam. Okay, fall of Sri Rangapatnam is the emblem of British victory. Yes? Yes or no? Okay. Media has a lot of influence on people's perception of things. Okay, so that is how initially when the media was actually very limited at that point of time, you can easily shape the mindsets of people too. Okay, with the help of media. Okay, media means through paintings, through art, through other things, you can shape the mindsets of people. And here they did it deliberately in order to okay make Indians look very weak when compared to the Europeans. Hmm? So they have done this uh, uh, deliberately. Okay, there is one more image in your inside textbook. You should see it. Okay, wherein okay the Indian Brahmins. Okay, in your inside textbook you can see it. I think in themes part three it is given. Okay, the Indian Brahmins uh, they are carrying the sacred texts of India and they are submitting them to the British. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the mother of England. Oh, so no, no, I think what is it called? Huh? Uh, Brittany. Hey, Brittany, Brittany or Brit Brittany? Uh, Brittany is uh, the so just like Bharat Vata for India, Brittany is the mother of Britain. Okay, the Indian Brahmins are shown submitting the sacred texts of India to her. Okay, asking her to protect Indian culture. Are you getting it? Okay, so this way they try to use media in order to shape people's perceptions of how things are actually. In reality, it is something else. Okay, but in picture, it is something else. And this kind of images are projected on multiple occasions. Okay, there were many uh, newspapers also uh, in England which tried to project a very, very poor image of India. There is a magazine called Punch Magazine. Okay, this Punch Magazine, it always was very critical of the Indian uh, freedom struggle. Okay, Indian movements, Indian character, Indian personality, all of these things are shown in a very poor light by this uh, Punch Magazine. Very, very popular magazine in England at the point of time. Okay, so they also sometimes used to use these paintings too in their, paint, in their uh, things. Okay, you write one line down here. Okay, some of these paintings were converted into oleographs. Oleographs be became popular across England. Any questions still here? I don't think so. Okay. Now we'll move to one more school of painting which is known as company paintings or company color. Okay, company color. So those are colonial paintings and these are known as company color. Okay, company color or company paintings. Okay, company color or company paintings. So these are a little important, okay, because they are Indian uh, paintings. So they are a little important for us. Just listen to me. What happened is Okay, all Europeans are not rich enough or powerful enough to bring painters from England to India. Okay, every small administrators cannot bring only the viceroys, governors. Okay, these kind of people can bring and commission these kind of paintings. But the rest of the Britishers also wanted to take some or the other image of India back to their home. So what they started doing is they started, okay, employing some Indian painters. Already there were many Indian painters who belong to the miniature schools, uh, mural paintings, all of these people are there, right? So these people, they started taking over. And what they did is, they taught some of these people, okay, how to draw a painting which is in tune with the British sensibility. British sensibility, it gave greater emphasis to realism, perspective, these kind of things, right? So they started training Indian painters in these techniques. And what the Indian painters did is, they were not very well adapted to the oil painting tradition. So they used their own watercolors, but they adopted the techniques which are used by the Europeans like realism and perspective. And these paintings are known as the company color. And here the main theme or subject matters are here also portraits is one. Second is, okay, the life of India, the animals of India, okay, the birds of India and the royal life in India. These kind of painting themes are selected. The color is watercolor. 
Okay, whereas the technique is European. Are you getting it? Okay, so that way they have drawn some paintings which are known as company paintings. And it is a hybrid Indo-European style of painting made India, in India by Indian artists, many of whom worked for European patterns in the British East India Company or other foreign companies in the 18th and 19th centuries. The style blended traditional elements from Rajput and Mughal painting with more Western treatment of perspective, volume and recession. Okay, recession means the same depth. Okay, recession. Special recession in paintings is the relationship between objects which appear to lie near to the observer and those which seem further away and thus recede into space. Same thing, sir. Okay, depth aspect is known as special recession. Okay, perspective, volume and recession. Most paintings were small, reflecting the Indian mi miniature tradition, but the natural his history paintings of the plant and birds were usually life-size. Okay, and the watercolor technique they used. Transparency of texture, soft tones and modeling in broad strokes, same thing. It is done on paper. They are meant for the albums of colonial administrators. And the prominent ones here are Sevak Ram and Gulam Ali Khan. Okay, this is the painting tradition. Okay, this is the painting tradition. Watercolor, but European technique. Technique is European. Theme is Indian. Or, let's see, sorry. The color is Indian. Okay, so this is the method in which they have drawn. Okay, this is known as a company color. Okay, this is one more painting. So it has some perspective, depth, all of these things are there. Okay, a special decision has been used here, depth in order to show depth. Okay, the images in the background, they are shown in very light color when compared to the image in the foreground. Okay, light and shading is also used. So this way, okay, they have drawn some paintings which are known as company color. And the next one is Raja Ravi Varma. Okay, Raja Ravi Varma, who is also present during the British colonial period. And this person, what he did is, he adopted the European paintings both in terms of technique and color. Both the things he adopted from the European paintings. Okay, realism, perspective, oil painting tradition, everything was European. But the themes he selected were very Indian. Indian themes and European technique is the Raja Ravi Varma's paintings. And they became very popular because most of his paintings are made in the format of this oleograph. Oleograph is they can be replicated. And immediately, they started becoming very popular across the country. And he established his printing press in Bombay. Okay, in Bombay, he established his printing press. He originally belonged to Kerala region. Okay, Kerala region. And he learned the European art of painting and established a Bombay printing press. And this Bombay printing press, it started becoming very, very popular. And you might have seen at least some of his paintings, okay, on multiple occasions. Because this is how Indians got introduced to the Western painting tradition proper. Okay, and uh, here, see this. So these are some of the paintings. Okay. So mainly the Indian themes. Okay. Of these paintings, this painting is very, very popular. Okay. So it is uh, the painting of Shakuntala. Okay. In Abhignana Shakuntala, she is waiting for uh, her husband. Okay. That is this painting. And this is the painting of Krishna Rayabar. Okay. Krishna goes to uh, Duryodhana and others. Okay. Saying that at least you give us five villages. You know the story. Okay. That is uh, re replicated in this painting. Then this is the story of Nala and Damayanti. Okay, here Damayanti is being shown. Okay, Damayanti. She is actually talking to a swan, okay, to take the message towards Nala. Okay, so that is a, this story, Nala and Damayanti story. I think I talked about this Nala Damayanti story once. No? It is also a very popular story of India. Nala and Damayanti. You can read it. Okay, Nala Damayanti story. Okay, you can read it. So these kind of things are painted. The technique is completely European, but the paintings are Indian. Okay, the themes are Indian. See this? Okay. Mastered Western art of oil painting realism with Indian themes. Realism, perspective, construction and composition. Same thing, sir. Oleographic uh, copies, Mahabharata and Ramayana themes. Okay. Yesterday, while starting painting tradition, whatever technique I used, whatever uh, techniques I talked about, the same things I am repeating again and again. Same things. Okay. So, this is Raja Ravi Varma. And later, during Swadeshi movement, there emerged a new school of painting which is known as Bengal school or Neo art school. Bengal school or new art school and it was started by this person called Abhidranath Tagore. He talked about this in constructive Swadeshi phase, if you remember. What they did is, they mainly rejected the western school of painting and wanted to, okay, draw paintings in Swadeshi terms. Swadeshi means indigenous painting tradition. For that, what Abhidranath Tagore did is, he travelled the length and breadth of India and studied the various painting traditions of India, which were present. And he was influenced by the Ajanta school of painting, Rajasthani paintings and Mughal Ragamalas. Okay, all of these things, they influenced this person called Abhindranath Tagore. And he wanted to revive these traditions. And along with these traditions, he was also influenced by the Japanese painting. 
Okay, Japanese paintings because Japan at the time, I, if you remember, I told you that Japan had a major influence on India because the Japanese won a war against the Russians and it became an inspiration for Swadeshi movement in India. At that point of time, the Asian cultural revival movement was started by the Japanese. And as part of this Asian cultural revival movement, some Japanese painters, they came to India. Okay, they started studying Indian paintings and they also taught Indian painters many things about the Japanese artistic technique. Okay, and they started feeling that the Indian and Japanese art uh, painting techniques are far superior to the European technique. Are you getting it? So based on that, he tried to recreate the painting tradition. Because in Ajanta painting itself, the perspective, realism, these kind of things are already present. There is no need to go to the European painting tradition. So those traditions he tried to revive. And this person is known as Abhinrana Tagore and his movement is known as Bengal school or neo art movement. And the most famous painting of this person is Mother India, you remember? Okay, with Kashaya. Okay. Okay, so that uh, Mother India painting is the most prominent one. Then along with that, he also drew one more painting, uh, which is of uh, uh, the story of Meghadutam. You remember Meghadutam? Okay, the cloud messenger of Kalidasa, where he extra sends a message to his uh, uh, wife, who is residing in the Himalayan region. Okay, and he is arrested in Ujjain. No, uh, yes, I think he is arrested in Ujjain. But just check it once. Okay, Meghadutam's story is also very important. That is one more painting that he has drawn. Okay, see this. Search for indigenous themes and techniques. Ajanta and medieval as inspiration. Expressive of India's distinct spiritual qualities as opposed to materialism of the West. Okay, influenced by the Swadeshi movement, you write. Influenced by the Swadeshi movement. And there is also some Japanese influence. And the main painters are Abhidhanath Tagore, Nandalal Bose, E.B. Havel. Okay, he's a European. He came to India as part of company school of painting, not company, uh, colonial school of painting. But he was influenced by the Indian painting tradition and he got converted to Indian painting tradition, E.B. Hevel. And it's this Japanese painter who came to India by the name of Okakura Kakuzo. Okay, Okakura Kakuzo is his name. E.B. Hevel, Okakura Kakuzo, Nandalal Bose and Abhinath Tagore. And uh, this is part of this pan-Asian revival movement in painting. Okay, pan Asian revival in painting. So, this is one. Okay, this is the image of Eksha. Okay, the banished Eksha of Megaduta. Okay. Here, okay, we don't see that European element of realism. Okay, complete attention to detail even for far off objects. Okay, they get merged into the background. Are you getting it? Okay, this is the painting tradition. Then Mother India, we already discussed about it. And this is also one more painting, famous painting of his, which is known as Jatu Grahadaha. It is influenced by the Ajanta school. See the images, the face cuts, okay, the body types, proportions, everything is Ajanta painting. Yes or no? Okay. So what is Jatu Grahadaha? Huh? Jatu Grahadaha. Jatu Graha is Mahabharata, you know. Okay, once uh, uh, Pandavas were asked to okay, reside in a house which is made of wax. Okay, Jatu Graha means wax house. Daha means burning. Okay, burning of the wax house is the theme here. Jatu Graha, Daha. more painting of Abhinanath Tagore. Okay, from here on our difficulty begins. Okay, it's a little uh, complicated from here on. Okay, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Okay, this is post-independent Indian uh, painting tradition. In post-independent Indian tradi painting tradition, I also want to uh, introduce you guys to okay, some ideas in painting which are uh, gaining significance uh, from the postmodern time, okay, postmodern time or post independence for India. So these painting traditions they started gaining significance. If you remember, okay, realism is something which is very very important school of painting which started with Renaissance period and it influenced the painting traditions of India and other countries. And only okay, this person that is Abhinandan Tagore he rejected this painting tradition. Okay, but after that, post post 1950s, what happened is in art there emerged a new movement of surrealism which rejected realism of the European paintings. Okay, they did not want to replicate human form as it is. Because I told you that already photographs have developed. Because of the development of photographs, these people felt that replicating human form as it is, 
or taking the or drawing the images of okay uh, drawing the images of picturesque scenes is not important anymore and most of the artists they started questioning what is the purpose of painting now are you getting it and at this time okay what happened is a new movement in painting started which is known as surrealism and in this surrealism there are many sub schools one is expressionism second one is impressionism third is uh, the symbolism and fourth one is this cubism so these four parts were there and some of these schools they had their influence on indian painting tradition too of which okay expressionism became very very important in india in expressionism what they try to do is they try to deconstruct every other emotion okay and emphasize only on one emotion in one particular painting okay they try to deconstruct every other facial feature nothing is important only one emotion it has to be conveyed properly to the person and along with that okay even in the observation of space also okay in the observation of space or surroundings also it is human beings each person perceives his surroundings in a different fashion okay your perception of your surroundings is different for each person so this perception is given more emphasis when compared to okay realism okay rather than how the things are how you perceive it started becoming more important okay perceiving of a person or perception of a person started becoming more important from this period and the second thing is from this period on most of the painters they started okay disrespecting both time and space they started disrespecting time and space what is time and space see every painting okay whatever the painting might be it particularly connotes a particular time when it is drawn time means you didn't understand okay one particular event it connotes okay let's suppose sri lanka patam the fall of sri lanka patam is there that is one particular event in history yes that is what time is every painting has a particular time let's suppose mona lisa is there mona lisa it what it tries to depict it tries to depict the youth of a lady yes bani tani painting is there it depicts okay kishan gar one woman during that particular age yes time is one criteria second criteria is the space in painting space means that every painting it tries to uh, confine in itself one particular idea of the surroundings okay time is time you understood space is one more dimension okay space is one more dimension that they follow it means that one particular event it will be connected in a particular space and from here on what the painters did is they started rejecting both time and space as the determinants for painting what they did is one in one particular painting they started showing events which occurred in varied periods of time okay i'll show it to you so varied periods of time the same space they started showing the images in then along with that space also they started disrespecting space they started disrespecting and by disrespecting the space what they did is they started including or integrating the images which occurred in different different space, spaces okay time and space they started disrespecting one second thing is they did not respect the realism perspective which was developed during the earlier period and the third thing is because photographs have developed here their main emphasis now began to give greater emphasis to imagination than what is actually present okay imagination was given more importance than what is really present and imagination okay based on the imagination itself a painting is judged now are you following what i'm trying to say and in perception too i told you yesterday while i was discussing about cubism what they try to do is they try to okay break down the images and reassemble them based on different different perceptions are you getting this okay so that way this is the fourth dimension of the paintings and okay uh, with these four what they did is they started developing new movements like expressionism impressionism symbolism and cubism in expressionism what they did is they gave utmost em emphasis to one emotion okay at the cost of all others all other emotions are not important only one emotion is important that is what is known as expressionism okay in impressionism what they do is they give okay more importance to the first impression that a particular image has on a person okay so i'll show the painting also that is the second school and in symbolism what they do is they use supernatural themes in order to represent uh, a particular idea that is the third fourth one is cubism breakdown and reassembly is cubism so this is the case okay i'll show some paintings to you then you will understand it better so this is a very famous painting which signified the start of modern painting tradition okay which rejected realism here some clocks are shown melting right means that time has melted away okay time has melted away in paintings 
and one more is this space it is going into the infinity here earlier paintings used to have some limitation to them but now the space is also expanded so this is what is known as the melting of time melting of clock by salvador dali okay so that is uh, different okay before coming to the indian painting tradition i'll just discuss some things ah. okay expressionism so this is these are the famous schools of expressionism here see is it what does this try to convey what is the meaning that it is conveying scream is the name okay fear is the emotion which dominates every other emotion okay background is not real face is not real okay but the only emotion which is predominating is fear yes or no okay so this then uh, one more is this uh, vincent uh, vincent van gogh okay this is a very very famous painter of modern times what he did is he drew this painting which is known as starry night before that okay mainly if you want to draw the space or night you used to give it a complete realistic perspective yes but this person he completely distorted the painting yes okay so this is the starry night which is also part of expressionism in symbolism okay this to try to use this kind of symbols okay see this all seeing eye is there okay and a head is being carried by the eye it means that a person will pursue through what he sees it means that okay seeing is more important than okay the person himself so it is the, the eye which is taking the human being towards the heavens okay so that is the case with uh, this one then the third one is impressionism so this is a impressionistic painting okay it is not realistic it is uh, somewhat similar to the uh, images of impressionism which are present in ajanta paintings okay i told you just in abhinandan uh, uh, tagore also impressionistic paintings were drawn so this is impressionism okay then uh, the next one is cubism so this is a very very famous uh, painting of cubism of pablo picasso recently when ukraine war also occurred this started this image started uh, gaining more significance okay and this was done or this painting was drawn during second world war in second world war it is uh, primarily about the bombing of basque okay you just see the image can you make sense of the image see it in uh, the handout and not when nothing is visible okay see here all half images partial images okay and every image here is suffering this is how war looks like okay what looks like so this is the famous uh, guernica or basque painting of pablo picasso see here okay woman is crying okay even the animals are suffering okay so these kind of things are drawn okay the representation of suffering that's it okay now so these schools they influence the indian painters too and indian painters okay, here it is important here there is a possibility of a question so there is there emerged a new school called progressive school of bombay from here you see progressive school of bombay they were established by raja and sauja two people raja and sauja are the two people who established this and uh, this fn sauza he started becoming more popular in the western schools because his paintings had all the new elements of painting expressionism impressionism cubism all of these things he used okay rebel painter expressionist colors and style infused with contemporary human situation first person to give get recognition in the west impressionism cubism expressionism paint with absolute freedom for content and technique almost anarchic of aesthetic order plastic coordination and color composition so this is the painting of sauja okay very very popular one i think it was sold somewhere around for 20 crore rupees okay so this one sauja's painting what is the expression which they are showing so it's so ugly sir it's putting me off okay yeah. but this is the image of law for uh, of law Okay, smile or laugh is the message here. Okay, what they did is they deconstructed every other feature and they made them deliberately ugly. Okay, in order to drag our attention only towards the smile. Okay, so this is a very famous painting of his for emotional effect in order to evoke moods or ideas. And this Raja, okay, he is also a famous painter. He is a painter of symbolism. You write it down, symbolism. 
throughout his life, what he did is he started drawing these bindus. Every painting of his has this bindus. The bindu has some spiritual significance for him. Okay, so the, those same things he has replicated on multiple occasions. He died some two, three years ago. Okay, he is a painter of bindus, bindu, symbolism. Next one is our famous hero that is M.F. Hussein. Okay, M.F. Hussein. And these are two images which are very popular of this person. Okay, he is a cubist. Okay, here this image is the image of Goddess Saraswati. Okay, Goddess Saraswati's image. And what he tried to convey in this image is, see this, this river is drawn, right? So this river is a representation of Saraswati river. Okay, Saraswati river. And here, this is the human form of Saraswati, the goddess of education. Okay, but the river has a break here. So he is of the opinion that in ancient India, the river was flowing very well. Okay, and knowledge has uh, emanated during this period. But during medieval period, there is a break. And now in modern times, again, the river is okay getting restarted okay, that's what he tried to convey in this picture okay but you might think that the meaning okay, but uh, it is there okay this is the image of saraswati and this is the famous image of mf hussein of horse okay yesterday i told you right it was cut into various pieces see the belly has come up because he felt the belly is more beautiful than the side part of the horse okay face also is completely deconstructed and then reconstructed was cut into parts and then reconstructed. Okay, this is M.F. Hussein. And I think you people know that because of his images of Indian goddesses. Okay, what happened is, okay, ABVP, RSS, these kind of organizations, they targeted him. And he was forced to run away from India. He went and he became a citizen of Qatar and he died there only. Okay, M.F. Hussein, very popular figure. Okay, at one point of time, just see. Okay, see this. Objects were broken, analyzed and then reassembled. Motif of horse is very popular. Solid and space effects of multiple viewpoints to convey a physical and psychological sense of fluidity of consciousness. Not very important, but just remember this person. Blurring the distinction between past, present and future. Okay, so this is the story of painting traditions in India. Okay, so here, when it comes to the later section, they can give a direct question on the progressive school of painting which emerged in post independent India. There is a high possibility. Okay, there you have to use the terms that I have used, okay, and the people that I have talked about, you have to write about them. So there is a good possibility of a main question there. Then apart from that, in prelims, in uh, this company paintings can be asked as a question. Okay, in prelims, company paintings can be asked as a question. Okay, then apart from that, Raja Ravi Varma, Abhidranath Tagore, anyhow, they are important for prelims. So this is the story of painting traditions of India. Is this all right? Okay. So next, after a short break, we'll start with music, dance and drama. Okay. The one more handout uh, will come. Okay. There I'll uh, discuss mainly about uh, this. Okay. Today, dance and drama I'll discuss. Okay. Is this all right? Any questions? Okay. Uh, analyze means... Uh, no, it's not analysis means what? Let's suppose, okay. So, can I put it? Okay. Analysis means what they did is, they broke down a part, let's suppose. Okay, and after breaking down the part, what they did is, they started observing the part in various dimensions. Okay, top end, bottom end. Okay, so how it is looking like in different perspectives, they started analyzing. After that, based on the most beautiful aspect of the part, they turned the image in the direction. And started showing that particular dimension to the onlooker. Hmm? That is what is known as analysis. Okay. So read the later sections where I talked about the European painting tradition. Okay. You will be understanding some things. Expressionism, impressionism and other things. You read about them. Okay. It is given there. Content is given there. But the crux of the idea, I think I have communicated it to you. Okay. So that is what uh, the thing is. Okay. Take a break for 5-10 minutes. After reassembly, we will uh, discuss about music.
，但老陳基一級咁樣得。阿啲啊，神仔 hand out hand out。So drama, dance, and the music are the three things that you need to remember. Okay, when ah、uh, comes to the tradition of a drama. Okay, drama, dance, and music. All three traditions, they have their origin in this very famous book, which is known as the Nadi Shastra. Okay, Nadi Shastra, which is written down during the period of Guptas. There is a person by the name of Bharata Muni. He is the one who composed this Nadi Shastra, and it is a foundation, foundational text for all three things. And of these three, today we are going to talk about drama and、uh, dance first. And when it comes to drama, if you remember. I told you that okay, Indian drama it has been influenced by the Greek drama. Okay, that is the reason why the curtain cloth curtain which is used in drama it is known as yavanika. Okay, which differentiates the front stage from the back stage. Okay, that is ranga from nepatya. Okay, ranga is the place where the play is played. Nepatya is the back stage. So ranga and nepatya they are differentiated with a cloth curtain which is known as okay yavanika. Okay, so this Indian drama it had. Been influenced by the European drama, and the very first drama which was composed in India is known as the Sariputra Prakarana. You remember Sariputra Prakarana, which is written down by a person by the name of Ashogosha, and the first Sanskrit drama in India it was composed during post Mauryan period. Before that, there were no dramas in India. Post Mauryan period, okay, under the patronage of Kanishka, the first drama of India has been written down, which is known as Sariputra Prakarana. From then on, the dramatical tradition in India it developed over a period of time. Now we are going to have a look at some of the basic elements of what a drama is in India. Okay, some theoretical aspects we will discuss. Then after that we will go to specific examples. This is a very small thing. Okay, very very small thing. Uh, very small thing. Okay, so first we will uh, start with. See, when it comes to Indian drama, most of Indian dramas they have four central characters to the drama. One is a Nayaka. The second is Nayaka. Okay, the second, third one is Pratinayaka, and the fourth one is Vidushaka. Okay, Vidushaka means comedian. Okay, comedian, villain, hero, and heroine. These are the four central characters for all Indian dramas. Okay, all all Indian dramas are based on these four characters. Then, okay, for every drama, okay, what in uh, Indians did is from ancient times on the dramatical tradition. Okay, when it is practiced, the drama stage is divided into two parts. One, second is sometimes the drama is also. Shown in two layers. Okay, two layers means two floors. It means the drama stage is present in one is ground floor and the second one is first floor. It means that whatever is happening on earth, it is shown in the ground floor. Whatever is happening, supposed to happen in heaven, it is shown in the first floor. Are you getting this? So this way, two stages or two floors is present for many dramas in India. That is the second thing. And the third thing is when it comes to Indian dramas. Okay, in Indian dramas, there are some characters which are known as allegories. Okay, allegories means let's suppose one character is there. Its only emotion is single emotion characters. It means that one character will be there. It will always be angry. One character will be there which is always happy. One character will be there which is okay having a single emotion to it, single tonality, without any complexity of personality. Only single character is given to single emotion is given to single character. Okay, that is how Indian movies also are made. Okay, the villain is always bad. There is no element of good to the villain. The hero is always courageous and good. No other uh, personality is there. So that is how. Okay, most of the Indian dramas are also based on allegorical images of personalities. That is one. Okay, that is the third one. And when it comes to the fourth the character of Indian drama, fourth character of Indian drama. Okay, the Indian uh, drama tradition. Uh, fourth character is okay. Allegorical drama dramas is one. Okay, then uh, Ranga Nepatya. And in most of the Indian dramas, Indian dramas avoided tragedies. Most of the dramas had very happy ending at the end. Okay, happy ending at the end. Then along with that, okay, if you see uh, one more element of Indian drama tradition, what other basics are there? Okay, I'll just uh, try to recollect it. Okay, Indian drama me, these are some of the important basics. Then、uh, along with that, okay, okay, just let's see the、uh, slides and、uh, parallel discuss. What happened directly? Muthuswami Dikshitar has come. This is the last slide. Okay, this is drama. So the not、uh, so I didn't get the handouts. Okay, I'll send them yesterday only, so they'll come. Okay, just see this. Okay, drama tradition of India. It started from okay, Nadi Shastra of Bharata, and the main purpose of Indian drama is it wants to 
take the individual mind away from the suffering of human life to okay a new dimension that is the main intention behind drama and dramas are also considered to be okay a place where okay people get entertainment vinoda is one and the second is to divert human minds from misery and conflicts of life is the second intention and this natya shastra it is considered to be the fifth veda okay this is important natya shastra is considered to be the fifth veda and this fifth veda that is natya shastra it contains many rules with respect to okay how a plot should be like how a performer should be like what should be the characteristic traits of a performer what should be the characteristic traits of a ideal audience also it says it means that audience also should not be okay random audience should be specifically selected for dramas it means that some criteria should be fulfilled if a person has to become an audience actor also should have some criteria okay and plot also should have some standardized features okay that is right clearly laid down lays down then along with these things what the say is in most of the dramas okay see the upper caste and men they are shown conversing in sanskrit language whereas lower caste and women they are shown conversing in prakrit language prakrit is a local language local tongue it means that there is language based discrimination in drama okay language based discrimination in drama that is one more important thing then the ideal stage is divided into ranga nepadya which is divided by a yavanika okay yavanika then uh, the next thing about indian dramatical tradition is the main characters are nayaka nayika pratinayaka and vidushaka four characters are there and both public and private performances were uh, conducted then sometimes there are two story th theaters too and in dramas prose and verse both of them are used okay prose and verse prose means dialogue verse means song okay poem verse means poem prose means dialogue so both of them are used and here the main intention okay of or the main idea behind the drama is okay one idea which is known as bhava and the second is known as rasa means that if the actor if he depicts a particular bhava through his action then immediately the audience will feel or it get communicated to the audience and audience will have this particular rasa okay and each emotion it has a particular set of bhava and okay the audience or the onlooker he has to feel that specific emotion okay whenever this particular bhava is displayed so that is what is the main intention of indian drama and there are many different kinds of bhavas which can invoke particular rasas in people okay let's suppose shanta rasa sh sorry there are i have given a list of bhavas and rasas let's suppose bhava is anger then the rasa which is invoked in the individual is known as raudra rasa then if uh, let's suppose love is being depicted then shringar rasa is invoked on in the audience it means that in fact drama is a collective experience of the actor and the audience without audience there is no drama without actor there is no drama whenever an actor displays a particular set of emotion immediately it should invoke a rasa in the audience and if the rasa is not invoked then he, this person is not a good actor are you getting this okay so that is bhava and rasa are the central themes of indian drama central theme of indian drama is bhava and rasa okay and in some of these dramas dance and music are integrated together and women and shudras are depicted speaking prakrit and other others converse in sanskrit in guptan period plays are not a tragedies and most of the plays are allegorical plays where human beings are personification of emotions It means single emotion single character then along with that there are two kinds of dramas in india one is known as a natya dharmi second is known as loka dharmi okay natya dharmi are the dramas which are uh, stylized dramas stylized dramas means okay there will be a particular prefixed plot and here in this briefly fixed plot the characters also display the prefixed emotions there will not be any newness or innovativeness in this natya dharmi style of uh, dramas whereas the loka dharmi style of dramas they try to replicate the human society as it is are you following what i'm trying to say so let's suppose okay if you take movies okay the natya dharmi movies are the movies of karan johar okay which are not close to reality okay so very very far away from reality okay whereas you know about this director called anra kashyap very very famous one so his like his stories are very close to reality so those are known as loka dharmi realistic depiction is loka dharmi okay a stylized depiction is natya dharmi so these kind of two kinds of dramas are present okay so this is the case and you have to see this bhava and rasa both of them are very important for indian performing arts performing arts mein okay even in paintings also we have seen bhava and rasa's role okay at least bhava we talked about whereas in performing arts 
Bhava and Rasa, both of them are important. In dance, it is the same way. In drama, it is the same way. And music also, it is the same way. It means that the actor or performer, he tries to invoke a particular emotion in the audience. Okay, by displaying some bhavas. This is what is known as the bhava and rasa concept. Okay, so wherein I think most of you also might be knowing about this bhava and rasa. Even today, the actors also try to do the same thing. Yes, okay, that is why audience cry in theatres sometimes. <laughs> yes, okay, so this is bhava and rasa. Okay, so there are nearly how many? Somewhere around how many bhavas are there? Eight or nine? Okay, I think one, two, three. 3, 3, 6, 6, 3, 9. Yes, 9, nine Babas are there in total and they invoke nearly 9 Rasas. Okay, 9 Rasas, anger, tranquility, wonder, love, heroism, grief, humor, fear and repugnance. Okay, so these are the 9 Rasas. Okay, 9 Rasas which are uh, talking about this. Okay, less possibility of a question, just I wanted to show you, okay, what it is, okay. Then the prominent plays are, the first play is Sariputra Prakarna in Sanskrit, Ashwagosha. This is the first drama of India. And it talks about the conversion of this person by the name of Sariputra into Buddhism. Sariputra's conversion to Buddhism is dealt in this play which is known as Sariputra Prakarna. This is the first drama of India. Then after that, okay, the later day dramas, some of them are important for us. That is Bhasa's Swapna Vasavadattam. Okay, Swapna Vasavadatta. And this talks about, you write these things down. Okay, this, this play, Swapna Vasavadatta, it talks about the story of Story from the age of Mahajanpadas. Age of Maha Janapadas. Maha Janapada period. Say, this is Swapna Vasavadatta. Okay, Bhasha. And it talks about the age of Mahajanapadas. And the main characters here are. The Vatsa King Udayin, the Vatsa King Udayin, and Vasavadatta, the daughter of Pradyoga Tanda of Avanti. Huh? Vasavadatta, the daughter of Chandra Pradyoga Tanda, you remember? Okay, he was sick in Avanti, Jivaka was sent to treat him long ago. Okay, we talked about him, Chandra Pradyoga Tanda. Okay. Yes. Chandra Pradyoga Tanda. Okay, who is the ruler of Avanti? Remember the 16 Mahajanapadas? Okay, there were many Mahajanapadas, right? Matsya. Okay. So then uh, Avanti, Kosala. Okay. So this story it talks about the theme. The theme here is the love story between Udayin, who is the king of Matsya kingdom, with the Vasavadatta, the daughter of of Avanti Mahajanapada. So, what they are doing is these days they are asking these kind of questions only. With respect to ancient India, the story of Swapna Vasavadattam deals with which of the following ages. It is the age of Mahajanapada it deals with. Okay, that is very important. Swapna Vasavadatta. Then next one is, uh, is Kalidasa. He wrote four. Okay, Abhignana Shakuntalam. We talked about them already. Malavika Agnimitram is deals with the story of Malavika Agnimitram. Gone. Agnimitra Sunga. Okay, it talks about the story of Agnimitra Sunga, Sunga dynasties. Okay, Abhignana Shakuntalam also had discussed the story of Shakuntala and Tushanta, okay, whose son is Bharata, after whom India is named. Okay. Then Malavika Agnimitram is a Shunga period. Okay, it is the love story between Agnimitra Shunga and Malavika. Then Vikramorvasiyam is the story of which period? It is a story about the Vedic period. Okay, Vedic period story it is. It is a story on the Vedic period king by the name of Pururva. Okay, Pururva and Urvasi, their love story is this, this one. Okay, write it down. All of them are very important. Not joking. Okay, already two questions have been asked. Abhignana Shakuntala, Marav Kaknimitram. One more story is left. That is Vikram Orvasim. There is high possibility of a question on that. Deals with the story of Pururva and Urvasi. Okay, Vikrama means winning over Urvasi. That is the meaning. Okay, Vikrama means victory. 
Then the next one is Sudrakas Mrichakatikam. This also you forgot. Guttan period, I clearly discussed about it. I remember very clearly. Mrichakatikam is the story of whom? Charudatta and Vasanta Sena. Write it down. Mrichakatikam of Charudatta and Vasanta Sena. I told you Girish Karnad, he made a movie on the same thing. Utsav. On. Out. Okay. <laughs> Chakatikam. Then, next one is Bhavabhuti. He wrote these plays which are known as Malti Madhavi, Mahavira Charitra and Uttarama Charitra. Then, Harsha is there. He wrote the plays called Ratnavali, Naganand and Priyadarshika. Okay, and the oldest surviving drama tradition in India is this tradition of Sanskrit drama which is known as Kuriyattam of Kerala. Okay, it is continuing from 10th century to till date. Okay, Kuriyattam is the surviving Sanskrit drama tradition which is present in India is this Kuriyattam. Okay, it means here, even now, the Sanskrit dramas are played. Okay, Sanskrit dramas are played here okay, in Kerala. Kudiyattam. So, these are the prominent examples of drama in India. Okay, and Bhava and Rasa are two important components. First is the Greek influence is there. You write one line down. Okay, the dramatic tradition in India emerged during post mauryan age. Emerged during post mauryan age. And it is an outcome of the Greek influence. It is an outcome of the Greek influence. Of the Greek influence. Is this all right? Okay. Now, next one is the dance traditions of India. Okay, the dance tradition of India is the next one. And the dance tradition also, it evolves from the same book that is Natya Shastra, which is considered to be the fifth Veda. And the same person that is Bharata Muni, he is responsible for the development of this Natya Shastra textbook. And okay, today in India, we have somewhere around some eight classical dances. And these dances are considered to be classical because they follow the conventions and rules which are laid down by Natya Shastra, Bharata Muni of Natya Shastra. That is the reason why they are known as classical dances. And when it comes to the dramatic tradition, here there are some key terms that you people need to remember. And this person, Bharata Muni, he says that any ideal dance, it should have three components to it. Okay, the first component is, which is known as this Nritta. Okay, Nritta is the abstract dance form which don't convey any meaning. And this Nritta, it is mainly meant to display the skill of a dancer. Okay, skill of a dancer is displayed, nothing else. Okay, skill of a dancer is displayed and there is no meaning to this dance. No meaning to this dance, no message is being conveyed, which is known as Nritta component of a dance. Then the second component of dance is known as Nritya. Okay, Nritya means it also has some rhythmic movements, but it tries to convey some message to the audience. That is what is known as Nritya. And the third component of dance is known as Natya. And in Natya, usually the Nritya component is combined with Abhinaya and words, Vachika. Vachika and Abhinaya along with Nritya, Nritya Sorry, Nitya is known as Natya. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So, three components are there to dance. First one is known as Nritta. Nritta is just rhythmic dance form without any message which is conveyed to the audience. Then the second component is known as Nritya, which shows dance forms and dance poses, but these dance forms and dance poses just convey some message to the audience. And the third component is known as Natya, which contains both Nritya, Abhinaya and Vachika. Words means Vachika. It means that here, the dancer, what he does is he tries to dance and along with dance, he shows some expressions in his face. And the third component is he also speaks out words while dancing. And all three put together, they convey a message to the audience. That is what is known as Natya. So, so every dance form in India, it has three components. It means that once the dancer enters to the stage, first he does this Nitya. He or she does this Nritya. Nritya is rhythmic movements which show the skill of the dancer. But they don't convey any message. Then after that, they pick up one or the other theme from Indian mythology or Puranas and they start dancing. And in the second component that is Nritya, the rhythmic movement is present. And this rhythmic movement, it tries to convey some message. Okay, what they try to do is they try to replicate hunting scenes. Okay, they try to replicate the court politics which are being done. Okay, then along with that, what they do is in the third component, okay, they do this Natya. And in Natya, what they do is they use both Abhinaya and Vachika in order to convey a message to the audience. So, I'll just tell one example. 
there is a very famous uh, dance which is known as Bhama Kalapam. Okay, Bhama Kalapam is in fact the story of okay, Satya Bhama and Sri Krishna. Okay, usually they fight, right? Okay, so the fighting scenes, okay, then after that, okay, whatever happens in the household of Lord Krishna with Satya Bhama, that is deprecated in this Bhama Kalapam. Okay, wherein, okay, uh, this uh, Satya Bhama, she actually becomes angry with Sri Krishna. Okay, and uh, she, uh, what she does is she leaves Krishna and she goes away. And Sri Krishna tries to, okay, win her love back towards him. So, this is the story of Bama Kalapa. And there will be two dancers. Okay, first they will come. What they do is, they will not pick up Bama Kalapa immediately. First, they will try to display or showcase their dancing skill to the audience. That component is known as Ritha component. Then after that, what they do is, they will start the Ritya component, which tries to convey some kind of message to the audience through their dance form. It means that fighting is replicated as a dance. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Then after that, the next third component is known as a Natya component. In Natya component, what they do is, along with, okay, this uh, physical movements, they also use face expressions and they also try to speak with the audience directly. Conversation will be there. And in conversation, they try, will try to tell some dialogues, sing some poems, and then after that, they will continue their dance. This is what is known as the third component, which is called as Natya. Is this all right? Okay, you open the slides. No need. Okay. Open the section. Okay. Ritta and Ritya Natya. Three components. Okay. And in Bharata's Natya Sastra, this particular section that is Tandava Lakshana, it deals with dance form. Dritta, Dritya and Natya. So there, near words you write Vachika. Okay, Vachika. Did you understand how the dance is usually performed? First display of skills, then, okay, that is Dritya, that is rhythmic movement which convey a message, then Natya, which contains Dritya plus words, then Typically, the features of Indian dance form. Okay, here there are many key terms. You keep highlighting the things which I am talking about. One is known as mudra. Okay, what is the meaning of mudra? Hand, okay, hand gestures are known as mudra. We, are all, we have already seen them. Okay, hand gestures are known as mudras first. Then, the second one. Okay, then the second one is known as cherry. Cherry means the feet movement are known as cherry. Okay, hand gestures are known as mudra. Hand Feet gestures are known as cherry. That is the second one. Third one is, okay, this one which is known as karana. Okay, karana. Karana means, okay, the hand and feet movements, both of them put together, okay, a dance pose is formed and this dance pose is known as karana. And there are in total 108 karanas in Indian classical dances. 108 karanas means 108 different, okay, body poses with the hand and feet placed in different formats. And these 108 karanas of dance in India, they are replicated on the temple walls of this temple called Chidambaram temple. Okay, I think I talked about this once before. Okay, Chidambaram temple, okay, wall pay. Shiva is shown in all the 108 different Karanas. Karana means, okay, feet in one particular pose, hand in one particular pose. They combined it together is known as Karana. And there are 108 Karanas. Okay, and Chidambaram temple, Shiva, he is shown in all these 108 Karanas. Then the third one is this Thing which is known as Angahara and the fourth one is known as Rechaka. Okay, when it comes to Angahara, okay, Angahara, okay, Angahara are the movements of other parts of the body apart from hand and feet. Okay, hand and feet, okay, alava, if uh, the other part is moved, then it is known as Angahara, okay, and in Angaharas itself, we have Rechakas. Okay, in Angaharas itself, we have uh, Rechakas, Angahara, Anga means body parts. Hara means, okay, in the form of a mala. Okay, Angahara is one, Rechaka is there. Rechakas are poses or movements of specific part of the body. Okay, Angahara ke sub part itself is Rechaka. And in Rechaka, we have, okay, different, different kinds of Rechaka. One is, uh, sorry, this uh, Grihva Rechaka, which is the movement of neck. Okay, then one more Rechaka is known as Kati Rechaka. Kati Rechaka is the movement of eyes. Because eyes plays a very important role in dance. So, eye movement, neck movement, okay, these are known as rechakas. And all rechakas are subparts of angahara. Because angahara is the movement of other body parts other than hand and legs. And its subpart is this rechaka, okay, rechaka. So, angahara, rechaka. Then, the essential aspect of dancing is bhava and rasa. 
Okay, bhava and rasa are the essential aspect of the dance. Then, okay, and the nritya format, it is classified into two forms. Okay, what is the meaning of nritya? Nritya is rhythmic movements which convey a message, right? Okay, so actually, this nrityas, they set the tone for, you write this down, set the tone for dance. They set the tone for the later dance. Okay, set the tone for the later dance. Okay, and there are two kinds of nritya. Okay, one is Tandava Lakshana and the second one is Lasya. Okay, Tandava and Lasya are the two components. So this Tandava is aggressive and masculine form of nritya. Then Lasya is okay, feminine. It means that, okay, first the dancer comes, he shows, she shows her skills first. Then after that, she conveys to the audience whether the coming dance is going to be either aggressive and masculine dance or feminine form of dance. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So that is what is known as a second component, which is known as Nritya. And in Nritya, there are two forms. One is Tandava, the second one is Lasya. Tandava is associated with destruction. Lasya is associated with creation. Usually the feminine characters are shown in Lasya dance form, whereas the male characters are shown in Tandava format. And the Tandava format of dance, they, okay, it also conveys the same Nataraja image, you remember? It was shown in Tandava and Lasya. So the Tandava dance form is a emblem for creation, maintenance and destruction. Yes. So this cycle of life is displayed in this Tandava dance form. And the second one is known as Lasya dance form. Okay, Nitya classified into Tandava is one. Masculine and the second one is feminine. It is a heroic, bold and vigorous movement and rhythm associated with Shiva. Lasya is soft, lyrical and graceful with the bhavas and Okay, Bhava and Rasa is more emphasized in Lasya dance form. Okay, Tandava represents the cycle of creation, preservation and destruction. Okay, so and it also represents the destruction of three evils. We already talked about them. Okay, three evils. Then, when it comes to Abhinayas, okay, Abhinaya. There are four different kinds of abhinaya. Four different kinds of abhinaya. Abhinaya or expression. One is the expression which is conveyed through mudras. Okay, one is expression which is uh, conveyed through the mudras, which is known as angika abhinaya, is the expression which is conveyed through the body and limbs. It means that each karana, it has its own specific meaning for the audience. Are you getting this? This is the first one. Second one is this vachika abhinaya. Vachika means the word which is spoken. Okay, by telling a story, the audience are communicated about what uh, is being communicated. Are you getting this? This is known as Vachika Abhinaya, second one. And the third one is known as Aharya Abhinaya. Aharya Abhinaya is the dress pattern. Okay, what kind of dress they are wearing is known as Aharya Abhinaya. And each costume, it specifies a particular meaning. Okay, I'll talk about it later in Kathakali dance form too. There you will see. It means that different kinds of costumes, they all already convey a message to the audience. See, some costumes are considered to be worn only by heroes. Some costumes are worn only by villains. The makeup also specifies a meaning to the audience. Yes or no? By just looking at the makeup itself, you will get to identify whether he is a good person or bad person. Okay? Or in the dance, not really. Okay? So in the dance, you can identify. So that is what is known as Ahari Abhinaya. And the last one is Sattvika Abhinaya, which is the conveying of message through facial expressions. Are you getting it? So Abhinaya are four forms. One is uh, this, uh, what is it? Angika, Vachika, Aharya and Sattvika Abhinaya. Okay, so these are the four kinds of Abhinaya which are conveyed, which are used. Then along with that, okay, so in Angika Abhinaya, there are again three parts. Okay, so three parts, one is known as Angas, Pratyanga and Upanga. Okay, so the body parts are classified into three kinds. Okay, first is Anga means the important body parts, Pratyanga are, okay, the other body parts and Upangas are, okay, the smaller body parts are known as Upangas. Okay, not very, very important. Let's just see this. Next one is, <coughs> next one is, okay, the dance also sometimes is classified. Apart from Tandava and Lasya, it is also classified as this format. Okay, one is known as Kashika, which means, Kaishika, which means gracefulness. Arbati, which means energetic and masculine dance. Satvati, which is uh, used mainly for depicting Rasas. And Bharati is the literary content. Bharati is the literary content content okay bharati is the literary content just listen to me once 
Okay, the basics of dance first you understand, then after that we'll go to the next section. So when it comes to the basics of dance form, okay, Indian dance, it emerges from this book called Natyashastra, which is written down by Bharata Muni. And in that, there is a particular section called Tandava Lakshana. And in this Tandava Lakshana, various forms of dance are spoken about. One is known as Nritta, the second one is known as Nritya, and the third one is known as Natya. Nritta is just specific rhythmic movements without any message. Then the second part is known as Nritya, which actually uses the dance poses and forms in order to set the tone for the coming dance. And in Ritya, usually there are two kinds. One is Tandava Lakshana and the second one is Lasya. And they set the theme for the coming drama. I told you, I think you understood, right? Pama Kalapam example also I have given. So wherein the dancers, what they do is they set the tone for the scene. Then after that, the main component starts, which is known as Natya. In Natya, what they do is they dance along with that. They converse with the audience. And along with that, okay, uh, what they do is they also give their expressions which are known as Abhinaya. So, Vachika, Abhinaya along with dance is what is known as Natya. So, these are the three components of dance. Then, when it comes to the dance poses, the hand poses are known as Mudras. The feet poses are known as Cheri. Okay, then the third one is known as Karana which integrates both hand gestures and feet gestures are known as Cheri. So, these are the three things. Then, Along with that, okay, we have, okay, uh, this uh, thing which is known as a Rechaka. Okay, Rechaka which is also known as Angahara. Angahara or Rechaka, it deals with the movement of the other body parts except for hand and leg. And in these Rechakas and Angaharas, we have, okay, the movement of eyes, neck and other smaller body parts is known as Rechaka or Angahara. Then, when it comes to uh, the Abhinaya part, Okay, Abhinaya, it can be of many formats. Okay, Abhinaya is through conversation. Abhinaya is through facial expression. Abhinaya is through body form. Abhinaya is also through the costume that a dancer wears. So, this way, Abhinaya is conveyed to the audience. Are you getting this? Then, apart from that, what else is there? Okay, the forms of dance is also there. Wherein some dances are graceful, some dances are masculine and heavy. Okay, these kind of dances are there. So, dance forms are also known as Arabati. Arabati or what is it? Yes. Okay, Arabati is the, the various dance forms. Okay, Kaishika, then other things are there. So, this is how the dances can be classified. Is this alright? And here, mainly, okay, the dances are made for, okay, one is entertainment and in order to convey a Bhakti Bhava to the onlooker. Here also, the most of the dance traditions in India, they are based out of Bhakti. Okay, and they are based out of Bhakti and uh, this uh, Bhava and Rasa forms an important component. And most of the dance forms, they are very closely associated with various temples. Temple-based dance forms emerge in India. They are not majorly meant for entertainment purpose, but they are meant for the sake of, okay, uh, taking a person closer to God. Okay, spiritual purpose is more important for Indian dance than the entertainment purpose. Are you getting this? So, this is the case. And even while performing a dance, the dancer also sometimes, okay, they are trying to replicate gods, gods through their dance. Okay, that is the reason why it is considered to be a very, very intensely spiritual process for the dancer too. So, this is the story of dance in India. Is this clear? Okay, will you be able to, but usually they will not ask any mains question here. It's always key terms based prelims questions only will be asked. Okay, no mains question here. But even if a mains question is asked, I think you can write some basics about dance. Okay, then after this. There are nearly eight different forms of dance in India, which are known as the classical dances of India, of which the first is very important one, which is Bharatanatyam. Okay, wherever there is a possibility of a question, I'll ask you to highlight them, okay? And listen to this. Bharatanatyam is the only dance in India, only classical dance in India, which is based on Shaivite themes. In all other dances, the themes are basically Vaishnavite. This is the only Shaivite themed dance in India, only one. Okay, all other dances are Vaishnavite themed. And this Bharatanatyam as a dance form, it emerged in Tamil Nadu region and it emerged from the Devadasi tradition which is present. Bharatanatyam dancers were all Devadasis. Okay, there, it is a Devadasi based dance form. But day to day, if you remember in modern India, I talked about this uh, woman by the name of Rukmini Devi Arundale. Yes, okay, so she is the associate of Anibisant. So Rukmini Devi Arundale is the one who brought this Bharatanatyam tradition from the Devadasi tradition okay, because what happened is with the time, the Devadasis, they got converted into prostitutes during medieval times and modern times. That is the reason why what she did is she tried to okay, develop this Bharatanatyam dance form and she learned from the Devadasis and the, she standardized it. And she started teaching it to the general public too. At one point of time, Bharatanatyam dancers are looked down upon in India. But she is the one who 
uh, brought it out okay and secularized not secularized it, it she started teaching this dance form to other sections of the society too are you following this this is the one and this bharatanatyam dance is known as fire dance because here the dancer he mainly tries to replicate okay the way in which a lamp okay lamp moves okay the fire on a lamp will be there so the fire on a lamp it flickers right so in the same format the dance is designed okay flickering lamp design it means that okay as the light flickers when okay wind comes same way the bharatanatyam dancer also should dance okay so that is why it is known as fire dance in india okay fire dance in india uh, and apart from that okay in bharatanatyam what else is there it is a uh, uh, okay we'll see okay we'll see some technical terms will be there so those things we'll discuss it is all right okay bharatanatyam i think you understood the basics now just have a look at this slide fire dance emerged from the devadasi tradition and it is a solo dance performance that is the reason why it is known as ekacharya last step it means that there will not be two or three dancers only single dancer will dance it can be either male or female okay either male or female it is a devotional dance and it is the only classical dance which is primarily shaivite the rest are vaishnavite and okay shiva as lord nataraja is the prime inspiration behind this dance and it draws heavily from the cholan temples of tanjore okay tanjore cholan temples are the place where this is mainly practiced and its prime focus is on abhinaya path okay and usually the dancers they sit in this half sit in position which is known as aramandi okay their dance is not based on very quick movement what they do is they have they will sit in this half squat position and after sitting in this half squat position through hands they try to convey various messages so at a half squat position is known as aramandi okay and the bharatanatyam is considered to be fire dance okay dancing flame aramandi you highlight and here you have to remember only some key terms here okay so in this dance it has various sub parts to it okay the first one is known as alaripu alaripu is the invocatory piece this is the uh, alaripu is the invocation piece where the dancer comes and prays to a particular god okay particular god this is the invocatory piece or this is the prayer prayer before the dance is known as alaripu prayer before dance okay, i think you know right okay in bharatanatyam there is a specific uh, uh, style of praying to god Okay, specific style of praying to God, and that is known as alaripu. That is the first component. Then after alaripu, the second component is known as jyotiswaram, which is a nritta component. Nritta component where the dancer displays to the public their skills, their okay, skills. Okay, like okay, they will lift their legs. Okay, they will uh, do some very very difficult uh, dance positions. Also, they display first. Okay, in order to prove their merit to the audience first. Then after that, they will enter into the story. Okay, shabdam is the dramatic element. Okay, dramatic element is known as shabdam and varnam is the nritya component dance and emotions yes okay then after that padam are emotions and expressions jawali are short love lyrics and tilana is one more component of this dance okay don't highlight all the things just highlight the things that i ask you to one is tilana okay tilana is one thing then along with that okay you highlight this term called jyotiswaram jyotiswaram and tilana only two things are important for us rest of the things are not very important okay tilana is important because the term tilana it is very north indian term right yes or no it's not tamil it is a tilana is actually a hindustani classical music tradition and this tilana it influenced uh, the hindustani music uh, the bharatanatyam dance form that is the reason why it is a interface composite right because hindustani classical music is present in north india but bharatanatyam dance form is present in south but both of them had an interface in this particular component which is known as tilana and it is also a pure nritta format pure nritta nritta format okay, at the end of the dance this is again performed that is what is known as tilana okay, you might have seen in some movies also okay, in movies most of the times the dance form which is displayed is bharatanatyam only in south indian movies at least okay so tilana is the end stage where in fact it is it looks something like jugalbandi okay, you know jugalbandi what is the meaning of jugalbandi competition right so here also tilana is also a form of competition between the tabla player and the dancer okay that is what tilana is no jugalbandi put okay this competition okay this so competition tilana last component that is pure nritta okay only two nrittas you should remember jyotiswaram is one and tilana is the second Okay, so this is the typical uh, dancer. Okay, 
Tamil Nadu primarily by females, but males also do uh, participate in Bharatanatyam dance. It's not just feminine. Male also participate solo dance form. Knees of the dancer are always bent. Okay, that is this uh, position, Aramadi position, you remember? Okay, so half squat in position and the knees will always be bent. Okay, they will never become straight in Bharatanatyam dance. Okay, so that is the reason why it is very difficult dance form. Okay, next one is Kathak. Okay, Kathak dance form. Okay, Kathak dance form is the dance form of North India. Okay, North India and this Kathak dance form, it is mainly influenced. Okay, yes. It is mainly influenced from a tradition which is known as Kathakara tradition. Kathakara tradition. Okay, these Kathakaras are the people who used to migrate from one village to another. Okay, and they used to... Uh, uh, convey some stories to the local population. This is what is known as Kathakara tradition. And this Kathakara tradition, during the medieval time, it has been influenced by the Persian traditions. And these Persian traditions and Kathakara traditions combinedly, they created a new dance form which is known as Kathak dance form. And this Kathak dance form, okay, it is mainly influenced by the Ras Leela tradition. Ras Leela tradition, it is influenced by and it is mainly danced to Hindustani music. Hindustani music, it is danced to. And in this dance form, the most important things are, one is the attire is entirely Persian. Attire is Persian, it is not Indian attire that is worn. It, 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 attire is Persian attire, one. And the second thing is, with respect to this dance, this dance, it gives more emphasis to the footwork rather than the hand movement. Footwork is more important here. And the third thing is, in this dance, Okay, there is this component which are known as pirots. Okay, pirots means the dancer, okay, whirling, whirling of the dancer. You might have seen this in, also in movies. Okay, when the dancer is standing at the same place, she takes spins. These spins are known as pirots. Okay, pirots are the most important aspect of this dance form and footwork is more important. And there are many sub-schools in this dance form. And there are gharanas at Lucknow, Jaipur, Raigat and Banaras, not very important. And here... Jugalbandi is important here, which is similar to the Tilana of every, earlier times. Okay, Jugalbandi is important. Then, okay, along with that, you just see this uh, one more thing, okay. Okay, it is performed with fast footwork and legs remain straight and knees are not bent in this dance form. Knees are not bent in this dance form. And, okay, the dancers in this uh, dance form, what they do is they only perceive space in straight lines. Let's suppose you are the audience. I can move only, okay, in this fashion, not to the sideways. So this is one more thing. Okay, one more thing is they only move in straight lines, but not to sideways. So this is uh, the one. And here the Rita component is known as Tarana, Toda and Tukta. All the things mean the same thing. Toda, Tukta and Tarana are all Rita component. Okay, so these are the components. See, how will they frame a question is, they will give some statements about the peculiarity of a dance form and ask you to identify the dance form. That is how they will give question. There is no other possibility of a question. Are you getting it? So, with respect to the Indian dance traditions, okay, uh, the following statements uh, talk about which of the dance forms. So, they will give this statement. One, they will ask, okay, which of the tradition is influenced by the Hindustani classical music and Persian uh, music. Then one more statement they will give. Okay, third statement they will give. And based on that, you have to identify the dance form. This is how questions are usually framed. Okay, so this is Kathak dance form. See here, okay, in Kathak dance form, this is the typical uh, dancing style, okay, in Kathak. Okay, so Kathak dance form, use of eyebrows, spins, legs straight, all, always straight. Okay, and fast footwork is there. And Indian and Persian costume. And the costume is Persian. This is the Kathak dance form. Remember in Kathak dance form, I told you about one major proponent of Kathak dance form. You remember the Sultan of uh, Avad, Wajid Ali Shah. Remember him? Forgot him. Okay, Wajid Ali Shah, he is a prominent proponent of this dance form. Okay, you can write it down. Wajid Ali Shah is a proponent of this dance form. Wajid Ali Shah. In Kathak dance is also patronized by this person by the name of Muhammad Shah Rangila. Remember Muhammad Shah Rangila? The late Mughal emperor. Shah Rangila and uh, Wajid Ali Shah. So this is the Kathak dance form. Okay, and the next style is known as Kathakali style. Okay, Kathakali style is the, the style of Kerala and this dance is known as sky dance. Okay, sky dance. Bharatanatyam is fire dance. This one is sky dance. 
Okay, unfortunately, there are only five uh, elements and eight dance forms. So only a few dance forms will get uh, their space. Okay, others are not associated with anything. Okay, so this is uh, sky dance, and Kathakali it is actually an emanation of the drama tradition of Kerala. Okay, in Kerala there was a very famous uh, drama tradition. Okay, which continued from 10th century AD. Just now we have seen this uh, uh, term also in a uh, surviving drama tradition from Kerala is Kuriyattam, right? So this Kuriyattam along with okay some other components of drama, they influence the evolution of this dance form. And this dance form Kathakali, it is very, very prominent one because of its peculiar attire. Okay, the attire of the dancers is very peculiar and they are having this very thick makeup on face. And even the dressing pattern is also very unique when it comes to this Kathakali painting. And in this Kathakali painting, okay, the most prominent aspect is that different face paints, they, diff they convey different characters to a personality. Okay, if the face paint is green, then automatically it means that this person is the hero. If the face paint is red, it is used for the sake of villain. And okay, some people are also shown in yellow face format. And the yellow face is used either for women or for saints. And some people are shown with a small beard. And these bearded people are considered to be sages. So this way, the dance itself or the attire itself, it conveys a lot of message to the person, onlooker. Then along with that, the Kathakali dance form is also based on, it uses a, it uses conversation a lot when compared to all other dance forms. And here, the conversations between the characters and the audience and the character, it is always done in a language which is known as Mani, Mani, Par, uh, Mani, Pravalam, okay, Mani Pravalam is the language that they use, which is a mixture of Malayalam and Sanskrit. So this new language they use in order to communicate the message, okay, that is one thing. And mainly they pick up the themes from Mahabharata, Ramayana, and they dance and enact these themes only. So this is known as the Kathakali tradition, okay, and it is influenced by the local drama tradition, and it, it also uses, okay, very vigorous and masculine movements as part of the dance form. And here, this dance form is performed only by men. Even the women characters are also played by men only. Okay, this is a men only dance. Not uh, women don't participate in this dance form. Okay, so this is what is known as the Kathakali dance form. It is a dance drama form. Okay, you highlight the things that I ask you to. It evolved from, okay, Chekir, Kutu, Kudiyattam, Krishnattam and Ramanattam. Okay, the main theme here is good versus evil. And the stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata are depicted. The characteristic feature is elaborate facial makeup and headgear. Green is used for noble characters, red for evil, black also, black is used for uncivilized characters. Women and saints are portrayed with this yellowish faces with white beard. The okay, language used is this Mani Pravalam, which is a mix of Sanskrit and Malayalam. One cannot make distinction between dance and drama portions of this dance. Kathakali is male art and the dancing is masculine. Men dressed in women's costumes portray female characters. Is this alright? Okay, then after that, the Kathakali remained in shadows till the great poet V. Krishnaminan. Okay, he is the one who revived this Kathakali dance form, V. Krishnaminan, you highlight the name. And the characters are also divided into three forms, that is Satvika, Rajas and Tamsika. Okay, so the three uh, characters, they are divided into and vigorous dance with usage of every body part. Okay, and uh, the skirts are known as Udut Kitu. Okay, Udut Kitu are the skirts. And Chitu Kutu is the makeup. Chutti Kutu is makeup. Udu Kutu is the gowns. Okay, this one. See this? Okay, green makeup, right? Okay, it means that is a hero. Okay, males fail. Uh, male plays female to intensive facial expressions. Colors of characters, elaborate costume. Okay, these are the, some of the important components of the Kathakali dance form. It is part of the Kathakara tradition. So, not Kathakara tradition is. Kathak, okay, Kathakali is the Sanskrit drama tradition. Okay, so it is important one. It is important one. There is a good possibility of a prelims question on this tradition. Then the next one is Kuchupudi dance form. Okay, it belongs to Andhra Pradesh region. Okay, Kuchupudi dance form and it is known as Arth dance. It is known as Arth dance. Okay, and this dance drama tradition is also very popular. Okay, and just listen to me. Okay, in this da dance drama tradition. What happens is both male and female, they together participate in this dance form. Okay, and uh, the main theme or the most famous of the Kathakali dance is the Bhama Kalapam dance that I just talked about. Okay, Bhama Kalapam is the main theme that they dance upon. And in this dance form, okay, there are in Ritta component, okay, where the artist displays his skill, 
okay, in order to display the skill, the artists, they take up some elements which are very unique and which are not present in any other dance form. What they do is, in order to display one's own skill, they will place a plate and ask the dancer to dance on the plate. Okay, and while dancing on the plate, they are supposed to balance a pot full of water on their head too. Okay, this is one. And then apart from that, they also have one more component wherein, okay, a small rangoli will be placed at the center of the dance. While dancing, they have to convert this rangoli into the image of a person, okay, or some other uh, beautiful object. Are you getting it? Okay, you might have watched this movie of uh, Prabhudeva. No? Okay, one old movie. Uh, it is known as... Okay, Nagma is the hero in a very, very popular movie. Okay, in Telugu it is known as Premikudu, but uh, I don't know what it is called. Shankar's first movie. You know Shankar director? Okay, so the director's first movie, but it is shown, okay, where uh, while dancing, he converts the uh, one Rangoli into the image of the heroine. No, absolutely no knowledge. <laughs> okay, then leave it be. Okay, are you understanding? Rangoli is converted into the image of a person. So this is the second important component of this uh, dance form which is known as Kuchipudi dance form. Okay, and it is known as Arth dance too. Okay, and uh, see this. Okay, so Andhra region dance drama along with the dialogue here also. Usage of speech in the dance distinguishes it from other dance forms, but speech is used in other dances also, right? So even in uh, Kathakali there is usage of speech. Here also there is usage of speech. And here the director is known as Sutradhara. Okay, in fact, before the start of the dance, what happens is the director comes onto the stage. Okay, he tells to the audience about, okay, the theme of the play and what is the main thing that they are going to display, okay, he gives a prayer warning to the audience, okay, whether they want to sit or run away, okay, so that is what is the role of Sutradhara. Sutradhara is known as the director, okay, director, director is Sutradhara, this dance form, Sutradhara announces the theme of the play and introduces the characters thereafter, okay, predominance of Shingara Rasa is one important one and the dance on plate is known as Taranga. Okay, dance on plate in which the performer dances on the edge of a brass plate, executing complicated rhythmic patterns with dexterity while sometimes also balancing a pot of water on the head. Okay, then there is one more dance form here which is known as Manduka Shabdam and Jala Chitra Nrityam is drawing pictures on floor with the help of a Rangoli. The most important one is this Bhama Kalapa. Is this alright? Okay, Kuchpuri dance form. Then, the next one is... Okay, so this is the image of this Kuchpuri dance form, men and women together, the dance in this uh, dance form. The next one is Mohini Attam. Okay, Mohini Attam is also a classical dance of Kerala. Okay, Kerala region and here this dance is known as air dance. Okay, someone was asking me this question, okay, later, some three, four days earlier. Okay, Mohini, uh, Kerala has two classical dance traditions. One is Kathakali and the second one is Mohini Attam. And here in Mohini Attam, the main theme of the dance is prefixed. Okay, it talks about the story of Vishnu who took an incarnation as Mohini. Okay, in order to kill this person by the name of Basmasura. Okay, Basmasura, Basmasura, he gets a blessing from Lord Shiva saying that on whosoever head he places his hand on, he will cut, get converted into dust. And okay, because of this blessing, Basmasura, he starts killing many people. And Lord Vishnu, he wanted to okay, use this blessing as against Basmasura himself. So what he does is he takes reincarnation as Mohini. And as Mohini, he goes to Basmasura. Okay, and what he does is he dances around him. Okay, and uh, stuff. Okay, and uh, finally, what it, she does is she okay makes Basmasura place his hand over his own head. So that's it. that is the main theme of Mohini Atam. And here in Mohini Atam, the main dancers are only females. There is there are no males involved in this dance. And the dressing pattern is also very simple. And the main dance theme also is a Lasya dance, but not Tandava dance. Here there is more significance given to grace and uh, sensuality when compared to rhythmic movements, okay, or vigorous movements okay, are not important, okay, grace and sensuality are more important in this dance form. Are you following me? Okay, just see this. Solo dance, Mohini is Vishnu in woman form to kill Basmasura, grace and elegance. Lasya is the dominant feature performed by females, okay, it takes elements from Bharatanatyam and Kathakali tradition, okay, Kathakali and Bharatanatyam tradition, grace from Bharatanatyam and vigor from Kathakali. Mohini Atam is complete absence of heavy stamping and rhythmic tension where the footwork is gentle, soft and sliding. Okay, Lasya is the dominant feature. This is important. Is this alright? Okay, this is the Mohini Atam dancer. Okay, Lasya element dominates, solo recital by women. Simplicity of costume, gentle footwork is are the important components of Mohini Atam. Okay, and the next one is Odyssey. Okay, and the Odyssey dance form, okay, it is a, 
associated with this element that is water okay and uh, this dance form is a very very prominent one okay very prominent one because in this dance form okay even in odyssey dance form okay i'll talk about it just wait uh, in odyssey dance form what happens is odyssey dance form it gives okay uh, or it derived from the folk dance forms of odisha first there are many folk dance forms from then this odyssey dance form it emerged and the odyssey dance form it is known for okay the peculiar ornamentation that women wear in this dance form mainly okay they use silver jewelry in order to uh, decorate a woman and in this silver, silver jewelry they have a very very prominent headgear which is known as tahiya the okay, tahiya is in fact a replication of the temple gopura on head the okay, temple gopura or shikara on head it is replicated in the form of this tahiya okay along with that in this dance form the main uh, thing is in this dance form the dancers they are expected to okay have slow and graceful movements okay slow and graceful movements they were expected to have and here in this dance form tribanga dance pose is given a lot of significance okay all the women they stand in tribanga dance pose only and they dance and along with the tribanga dance form this dance also gives emphasis on hip deflection okay the movement of hip is uh, given a lot of significance hip deflection is given significance here and the folk dances from which uh, and this dance form is also known as a mobile sculpture mobile sculpture because of the slow and graceful movements which the dancers are supposed to show display they are known it is known as mobile sculpture just see this grace sensuality and beauty it is known as mobile sculpture and it emerged from three folk dance traditions which are known as mahari gotipuva and nartaki okay nartaki gotipuva and maharia and here the poses which are emphasized are tribang pose is one and the second one is chok pose okay chok pose is a half sit in position okay just like aramadi this is also one pose okay chok and tribanga okay hip, hip deflection is the characteristic feature it contains very sensitive facial expressions it is known for its ornamentation in silver jewelry okay and tahiya is the representation of a temple tower and here is the representation of the temple top okay so this is the dance form okay low sorry sorry okay why this image it contains some information which is okay okay vigorous movements and low emphasis on so you rather than low you change it to sensitive facial expression Okay, why get confused unnecessarily? Sensitive facial expressions are emphasized here. Sculpture like body poses, hip deflection, tribanga posture, tahiya. Okay, and it, the dance also has okay vigorous movements to it. Vigorous movements to it. Okay, vigorous movements and graceful movements are also there. So this is the Odissi dance form. And the next one is Satarya dance form. Okay, and this Satarya dance form it emerges from Assam region. i already talked about this dance form once before shankar deva yes okay shankar deva i talked about how he is a polymath who developed numerous things okay numerous drama types dance forms also were developed by him and this satarya dance form where upsc has already asked the prelims question on this they developed at a place which is known as satara satara is the is a place where the vishnu bhaktas the stay is known as satara okay and developed in this sataras Shankar Deva and his monasteries, which are known as Sataras. And here, the main theme is Vaishnavite here too. Okay, and initially only the male monks used to dance, who are known as Boks. And the music to which the, it is danced is known as Bargit. Okay, Bargit is uh, the music to which it is danced to. Okay, and it is done in accompaniment to the drama tradition, which is known as Ankya Nat. Okay, Ankya Nat, do you remember? Ankya Nat, Ankya Bhavana. Okay, both of them are dramas of Shankar Deva. So Ankya Nat and Ankya Bhavana. You write Bhavana also. It is given here. Okay, Ankya Bhavana. And there are many local dance forms also which influence them, which is known as Bihu, Ojapali, and Devadasi dance forms. Okay, Assam region, right? So there is a reason why Bihu is the, a very prominent festival in Assam and dance also. Okay, Bihu, Ojapali, and Devadasi. Okay. and uh, here when it comes to the characteristic traits they are not very important of this dance okay we give hasta mudras footwork aharya and music everything else is same okay so satarya dance form shankar deva sataras 
Okay, both male and female dance there. Okay, you write one line down. Both male and female dancers are there. And the main themes are Vaishnavite, Vaishnavite. And the dance is performed to the music called Bargit. Okay, it's everything else is given there. Angkya Nat, Angkya Bhavana. Okay, next dance form is known as Manipuri dance form. And this Manipuri dance form, it has evolved in modern times. Okay, modern times, this um, dance form has emerged. Okay, and there is a lot of patronage of our Rabindranath Tagore for this dance. Okay, Rabindranath Tagore, he in fact set the standards for this dance form, which is known as Manipuri. Okay, Manipuri dance. Okay, Manipuri dance. And this is also influenced by the local tribal traditions first. And apart from that, okay, mainly the themes are Vaishnavite themes in Manipuri dance. Manipuri dance also the themes are Vaishnavite themes. Vaishnavite themes. As part of this Vaishnavite themes itself, okay, what the rate is in this Manipuri dance form, okay, mainly, okay, so this dance form is uh, mainly performed by women, okay, mainly performed by women, even the male characters are uh, done by women, okay, male characters are also done by women in Manipuri dance form. And here, the influence of Shankar Deva, okay, Shankar Deva is a bhakti, not Shankar Deva, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is a bhakti saint of Bengal region, so that Vaishnavism, it had a lot of influence on this dance form. And in this dance form, the most important aspect is that, okay, in this dance form, leg movement is not very important. Okay, leg movement because, okay, the legs are covered by, okay, long gowns. Okay, long gown covers the legs. So, leg movement is not very, very important. Okay, whereas uh, leg movement means leg shapes and leg movement are not very important. Okay, but hand gestures become more important in this dance form. And the main themes are Krishna and Radha. Okay, and Krishna and Gopis is the main theme of this dance form. And here... In this dance form, there is one mudra which is very, very popular, which is known as Nagabandha Mudra. In Nagabandha Mudra, the dancer, she stands in the position of letter 8, okay, the number 8. It means that hands, legs and other things, okay, she stands in the shape of this number 8, which is known as Nagabandha Mudra. That is very important. Then along with that, this Manipuri dance, it is danced to a specific uh, instrument which is known as Kartal. Okay, Kartal is a drum, okay, which is used here, okay, Kartal. And Pung, okay, two things are there. Kartal is this, uh, what is it called? Okay, two bronze things are clapped together. Kartal it is called as, okay, in Hindi. But I don't know what it is called in uh, the local language or English. Okay, Kartal is this and Pung is a drum. Okay. It is used in marriages also for the sake of music. Yes, okay, that is what is known as Kartal. Kartal and Pung, okay, two things are there. Okay. So even at the time of death also it is used, right? Okay. So, okay, so this dance form, it has no sensuality, only devotion to it and is influenced from the tribal traditions of Lai Harao, okay, Thangta and the tradition of Sankirtana. Sankirtana is the tradition which is established by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, okay, and limited use of mudras, slow and gracious movement of hands and knees, okay, it is based on Raslila tradition, Jaydeva and Chandidas Kirtanas. Nagabandha Mudra, its aim is to make rounded movements attempt to connect body through curves with a pose in the shape of 8, thereby avoiding jerks, sharp edges and straight lines, not very important, just remember Nagabandha Mudra, okay, this gives soft appearance, it is a pure female dance and faces of females are generally covered with thin veil and they wear a long skirt, okay, so Radha Krishna themes dominate, and Punga is the drum which is used, okay, they are known as symbols. Okay, the kartal are known as symbol, small symbol, okay. Then a colorful decoration, slow movement, it doesn't pay much attention on facial movements, but pay emphasis on hands and knee position. Spreading of legs is not possible in this dance form, but the foot movements play a very important role in this dance. Means that, okay, so because of the long curtain, okay, long dress, what happens is the shapes are not important, but they will be quickly moving from one place to another. Okay, that is how uh, this dance form is uh, there, okay. Now, see this, okay, this is the dance form, only female dance form, okay, Manipuri, gentle footwork, long skirt, legs spreading is not possible, graceful, slow movements, thin veil, okay, female uh, dancers are there, okay, so this way you have to remember this dance which is known as Manipuri dance form, okay, Manipuri dance form, I think this is the last classical dance, right, yes, okay, this is the last classical dance, after this we will uh, discuss about music, okay, but music we will discuss tomorrow, because uh, thematically it is a uh, 
little uh, distinct okay and uh, we need to understand it properly okay so do you have any questions here no hey see unfortunately i can't dance okay act or sing that's the reason why okay maybe you might feel a little disconnect with the class okay but because these are performing arts without performance you can't preach them okay but we are doing it okay so someone of you are good then please okay the stage is yours 10 more minutes is there okay <laughs> there is no problem with us uh, with me okay any questions here okay but just remember superficial understanding and reading is also sufficient okay so there is no need to go into the depth of each thing and understand them okay because they are very very complicated things and upsc also did not go to such a such an extent okay if you are any additional knowledge well and good for you okay but uh, don't try to go into too much of depth is this all right okay yes yes that is the reason why i asked you to make map okay there is nothing to teach there what will i teach okay i'll tell the name this is particular region this is the only one or two things will be there okay th then i have to tell them not yes 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 i think it is in andhra pradesh telangana government has banned this drama called chintamani okay, but that is not a folk drama okay that is just local language drama it is not folk okay folk is yakshagana okay these kind of things are known as folk okay yakshagana is a common uh, drama tradition for karnataka and telangana region folk and local local are just vernacular dramas which are uh, developed during modern periods folk are present from uh, in older time okay that is the only difference let's suppose if i write a drama today okay we cannot call it as a folk drama right okay there are modern dramas that's it hmm? any other question okay painting dance drama and last one is music okay once the music is done okay we will be done with the culture we will move to modern india tomorrow okay but carry the hand out don't forget okay so that's it for today okay five minutes before only i am leaving you guys okay have a good time and uh, 12 15 the next class will start right